The Team Never Quit podcast is brought to you by Navy Federal Credit Union. Partner with Navy Federal Credit Union to pay down credit card debt. Learn more at Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Team Never Quit podcast. Remember guys, make sure to check out our social media pages at Team Never Quit, where you'll find all our latest news see special updates, and for our Patreon subscribers, some pretty sweet exclusive drops coming soon. We have a very good show today for you guys. Uh, We have on Chad Robicho and Dennis Price. Uh, Let's kick this off with our Patreon question of the day before we get into that, uh, which is, if you were given a one-minute ad slot during the Super Bowl, what would you fill it with? Oh, man. What kind of commercial? <laughs> I'd, I'd say, for me, uh, I, w- I would do something regarding, I mean, everything I promote, every time I get a chance to promote something, I, I promote Mighty Oaks uh, or, or you know, in the service style warriors because it's, to me, it's one of the biggest crises in our country right now. Mm-hmm. It's just something, you know, I think our nation needs to be know what our veterans are dealing with after 20 years of war and being uh, in, you know, America, the American communities around the world is the ones who sent our troops out to, and defend our country and when they come home they'd be embraced and, and welcome home by by the those same communities so i'd be a i'd be you know advocate for making sure americans know what's actually going on in our veteran community and, and how they could help very nice i like that i feel like you had that one yeah commercials are always so they need to be fun they either need to be a tearjerker or really funny um i have nothing that i would i need to promote other than i mean i don't know i i I, my mind's blank i don't know what about you dennis he he pretty much (laughs) got the same answer (laughs) i promote a a non-profit that helps troops out that brings uh the focus back to uh, what is really important outside of a football game, you know, uh, our freedom, supporting the troops and the real stuff that's going on outside of our uh, direct world and mm-hmm. uh, part of the bigger picture and helping out. Mm-hmm. I think I changed mine. Mine would be an anti-woke message. Yeah. <laughs> I freaking hate the woke. The, th- the thing that first hit my mind before I answered, because I, I paused for a second because I didn't even know you were, he was talking to me. <laughs> As I paused for a second, but the thing that first hit my mind was like a message of unity. Yeah, because uh, real unity. Because uh, it seems like everything's meant to meant to divide right now. It is the, the whole I woke agenda that. is meant to divide. And I hate that we can't just be honest and have constructive conversation and and solve problems. I'm naturally a, sol- a problem solver, so when you have to just skirt through issues because you might hurt someone's feelings, that just drives me freaking crazy. I'm like, yeah. let's just cut all the bullshit and yeah. just be honest get it out of the way and then and then work together yeah truth truth hurts people's feelings yeah. and it's okay it drives me crazy. <laughs> so my my super bowl would have something to do with that probably minutes a long time minutes of yeah very long time yeah so man, i take good. every motivational commercial that we ever had coming up yeah those little moments oh yeah <laughs> that i mean everyone's ever heard of american moments yeah. right with that had that good background, that league blue playing or something, next to Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. And every one of them flashing through in, in, in session. So each generation sees their kind of their, their self in that commercial. Yeah. And the way you deal with something that is designed to cause chaos like that, you got to jujitsu the crap out of it, man. Yeah. You use its weight against it. Try to go against it. You fight all day. You got to actually create something that's more powerful and push in that same direction. Right. <laughs> it consumes everything else. Can't even, yeah. you wouldn't even pay attention to that ever if there's something else doing it. For sure. But we've got some good ones. Over time, I, it, it, ever since the, the YouTube and everything came online, man, you, you, you can hear that stuff when we were kids. Yeah. I never had access to. Yeah. I, I, this generation needs to go back and we were talking before the show started about our generation. Go back and watch some uh, some American Ninja. Oh, I, don't, so I, don't mean, good, I don't mean American Ninja Warriors. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, all those. The, uh, Just, some Chuck Norris, Delta Force. <laughs> I saw a commercial the other day I had when Van Damme was doing the splits between mm-hmm. the two Volvos and it had Chuck in between the two airplanes <laughs> <laughs> with the flight yeah. attendants hanging yeah. off of him. Dude, I thought that was great. We yeah. love Chuck Norris. He's great, man. And yeah. we actually got to meet him um, 
Marcus got invited to be the speaker at one of his um, fundraisers, one of Chuck Norris's fundraisers. And they they had Marcus come out to actually tell Marcus's story, but he gets up there in the entire hour that Marcus was to talk, he told Chuck Norris jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help him. They yeah, yeah, just, that's just, just <laughs> the entire time. And I happened to be sitting next to Chuck Norris and he's like, what? He couldn't hear what Marcus was he saying. He can't hear. He can't he hear, could hear me. Well. He can't hear oh, he's and he's like, what is he saying? And I was like, He's just talking really good about He's bragging you. about you like you can't believe, man. <laughs> Which I heard he one was. Other, dude, I was. Yeah. I heard one the other day that said Chuck Norris threw a grenade and killed 50 people. Then the grenade went off and killed 20 more. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that one. <laughs> one of my coolest stories. I don't have any proof of this, but at, we were at a, at, a, at, a, at a function. I'll leave it at that. And then we walked into in the bathroom, three urinals, Chuck Norris, President Bush, and myself. Yeah. yeah that, that's a good story. <laughs> And I wanted to ask somebody to take a damn picture. <laughs> but or a no, I did. Yeah, I was you like, "Holy, oh, Chuck Norris, and there's the damn president, man!" It was. It was That's cool. pretty cool. It was. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's yeah. cool. Yeah. It was. Yeah, I mean, so much so that I was like, "I had to get, I get somebody recreate, guys. recreate that picture, like draw it." Having to go right. painting. Yeah, that painting. would be great. It's all three of you from the back of you. Dude, <laughs> just kind of staring at attention, you know? Like, not doing that. It should be the with the bubble going. Holy shit, it's Chuck Norris. Holy shit. <laughs> Oh my god. This is stream I, peeing each other's urinals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got a bottle of Chuck Norris water in the back of my truck and my I was cleaning it out the other day and my son Axe was throwing all the garbage out. I was like, no, no, you gotta, gotta keep that Chuck Norris water in the back because oh, you're running like, gas. He has like some kind of access to some certain water, right? That he's yeah, 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 yeah. On yeah. his land, yeah. it's like real clean, pure water. I was like, I'll bet you could run your truck off of it. That's why I keep it back there. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Norris water. That's a new commercial. <laughs> Port in the truck, it turns the uh, to uh, from Transformers. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. This thing will stand up. Can't believe it. Uh, for my commercial, I mean, I would definitely have to to. Do what you were saying. Go more of a joke. Uh, yeah. Maybe some sort of prank video where we just run around uh, pranking a whole bunch of uh, kind of cool people. Mar- Marcus also loves prank videos. He loves That's doing where I get it from. silly, like yeah. almost skit type things. He's always always has some idea of doing some like recreation of Napoleon Dynamite or something <laughs> like that. Well again, look at what you had to work with and then their their generation take it take it to a different level. Yeah. Like some of the stuff they do. I'm proud of them. Yeah. <coughs> proud of them. We were something, but yeah. these these jokers, man. Like all yeah. of the guys in Hunter's fraternity at LSU got Marcus he got a hold of them and he's like, All right, this is what y'all are gonna do and he just gave them all kinds of assignments and no, no, listen, they got it done. They'll have a bet and if one of them loses they gotta take the damn A C T or the, the S A T and yeah. pass that damn thing, dude. <laughs> <laughs> or take it again. I mean, yeah. I never took it to that level, but yeah. I was thinking about was like our bets like if if you lose you gotta join the Navy again. Yeah, <laughs> for, for four years, bro. Or go take the that's a bet. <laughs> yeah, you want to bet? Let's not yeah. let's do that, man. Yeah. That's a you commitment. Can, You'll get something out of it. Yeah, you can survive losing a paycheck, but what's up? <laughs> <laughs> four years, dude. You lose a bet that big, you gotta. It's like, hey, pay up or join the navy. Serve your country, man. John, do you have one? That's funny, man. Um, what would I do as a Super Bowl commercial? I think I'd have to play off of one of my favorites. The old frog, the Budweiser. Oh yeah, that oh, that's yeah, a good yeah. Call. Every good commercial came through. Yeah. What if you had like a cover band for every awesome uh, music performance yeah. in between the, oh, for halftime going? Yeah, yeah, that would be something good. like that. You know, yeah. Yeah. a little highlight reel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or All right. just yeah, kind of do my own halftime show in that one minute. Yeah. Just, myself. just you, huh? <laughs> Doing your thing, man. <laughs> one man show. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. Well, so we, I know you're promoting a book right now, but can we just get a little bit of background of yeah, like who of you are, where you come yeah. from, and both of you? Um, would you like to do that with our show just for our guests to get to know you and actually feel you know like coming we up? know you? I've also got a summary that uh, that I was going to oh, yeah. go in there. You read it? Yeah. So we've got a great guest to store for you guys today. Chad Rewicho is a former. Force Recon Marine and DOD contractor with eight deployments to Afghanistan as part of of a special operational task force. After overcoming his personal battles with PTSD, Chad founded the Mighty Oaks Foundation, 
a leading nonprofit that has served over f- uh, 450,000 warriors through their faith-based combat resiliency programs and led life-saving programs for over 4,500 active military and veterans through the Mighty Oaks Legacy Programs. Chad has also served as a special agent with the U.S. Federal Air Marshal Service as a surveillance detection senior program manager with the U.S. State Department and as a law enforcement officer where he received a Medal of Valor for his bravery above and beyond the call of duty. Welcome to the show, Chad. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Let me read these some of these yep. out loud. They don't. Pretty they don't impressive sound real. resume. I was like, man, you know, th- think about that. When we started, go yeah. back in the day when you were signing up, somebody yeah. rolled in one of these. You're like, no. <laughs> Pretty impressive. That's just means though. I'm old. <laughs> that's all that's it means to me. Right? Yeah, that's all it means to me. Is I'm like, oh, yeah, it just sound, makes around. me sound old. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about you. Where where'd you grow up and yeah. what got you into the military? In the yeah, I grew up in Raceland, Louisiana. Uh, you know, really South Louisiana where you got mud between your toes. And, Talk about yeah. down south though. Yeah, <laughs> real down south by, by Lafouche, Lafouche right. Parish. Yeah. Uh, uh, like Homa, Thibodeau, that, yeah. that area. So, uh, and then my family had 84 years of service. So uh, from now, so uh, World War II, uh, Korea, uh, my dad was the first Marine in my family, Vietnam. Are you, I was gonna, that's where I was going with that. Yeah. Oh, is that, you got Marine. a Marine line in yeah, there? Yeah, he's the first Marine. And then both my sons, Hunter and Hayden, both served in the Marines. And even though I did eight deployments to Afghanistan, the hardest deployment was for me was when my son Hunter went to Afghanistan. I bet. Same war, mm-hmm. right? Uh, okay, so <laughs> we've talked about that before. The, mm-hmm. the, the, yeah. the, the, those guys exist. Yeah. Yep. And um, which is, we're not letting that go down for the next generation. Yeah. No. Yeah, it was... I mean, it was a crazy thing. I, I had a, uh, I mean. How I about mean, that? I mean, that's yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> we were kids and our freaking kid is strapped up into that. Same thing, yeah. War. And then the, the evacs, you know, we, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But, you know, when, when, when Sar Silent left to do these evacs, he's like, Dad, I don't want to go. And I'm like, no, man, you can't like, go to Afghanistan. Like, he's like, I already went. And I, I had an interpreter too. Like, I, I want to be part of this. And how could I say no? Like, how could I keep that from him? And he hold that against me for the rest of his life. So I let him be part of it. And, mm-hmm. and now he's like, he just got back from Ukraine a few days ago. He's about to go again. So he's part of our international team. Wow, that's and, awesome. Uh, and that's great. You know, so. Oh, well, if, it, if for whatever reason they come out and they, they come from, mm-hmm. turn out like we are, you got it. You can't deny it. Yeah. I mean, it was, I'm like, man, I would, he would be, he would be uh, chewing on that for the rest of his life. I think I'd about be. it all the time with him. I was like, if he, I try to, I don't push it on him, but yeah. if he signs up, I'm going to kick him in the ass. He ain't got no choice. Yeah. Be, we do things though. The hard way around here. Yeah, you can do it if you do it, do it right. And, well, thanks yeah. for your service, man, and especially for you for your kids. And that's yeah. Yeah. that's an honorable thing. All so the way back, has it been Marines the whole time? It, it was. I mean, like I said, my dad, uh, my dad, me, and then both my sons. But for me, uh, it, it's kind of seal story with that. Uh, I was a. Uh, I had a brother. He was a. Uh, he was a year older than me, and we grew, very dysfunctional home because my father never really recovered from Vietnam. He didn't get the help that he didn't get the, the kind of help you guys do and the kind of help we do. They didn't have that for these guys. Yeah. And, uh, and, and my dad didn't get that. And so it's very dysfunctional, a lot of physical abuse. And so my, my brother and I, a year older than me, we'd always talked about joining the military. We grew up playing, you know, playing military out in the woods and the swamps and bayous. And, and I remember we saw this video, you probably seen this video too, cause we were the same age of this. It was filmed down at the strand in Coronado. And they were like, they like, they like came in on helicopters and, and boats and they, they, that's that's the only reason I got in there. Man. Yeah, that video, <laughs> right? My life. Like, we didn't have much back in the 1900s. There wasn't a lot, a lot to watch. That's yeah. all we had. I seen that video, man, and I'm like, and, and then I remember seeing this this seal come out of the water. And he had twin 80s on his back and his face painted green, like seaweed hanging off his head, and he's got his yeah, his M16. And I'm like, I want to do that, but I was like, I don't want to join the Navy. <laughs> and uh, and it was my dad. Everyone says that. Like, I'm like, Can I be a seal, not join the Navy? I said the same thing. I don't want to be the Navy. I want to be a seal. Bro, they go together, man. You can't. Well, I, I was like, my, my dad was like such a dysfunctional and like angry human being, but the only thing that ever made him happy was the fact that he was a United States Marine. And I was like, well, what's like that in the Marine Corps? And I, and I started reading these books of like all these recon Marines and force recon Marines in Vietnam. And as a teenager, I became infatuated with it. And uh, when I was 14 and my brother was 15, we were already like running and swimming and because we grew up as athletes and, and he was shot and killed. And uh, mm-hmm. so it was devastating to me. So for me, it was like a promise. Uh, to my brother he to finish was killed that goal. before he before he got to go to the military yeah he was he was 15 uh, oh my 15 years old. i was 14 he was 15 and and uh he was he was shot uh by a stepbrother and uh with a 20 gauge like point blank in his chest and so he died right away oh my and gosh. so my family what i had left of family fell apart when i'm 17 years old i'm probably not gonna graduate high school 
and I go to Marine Corps recruiter named Staff Sergeant Brown. I remember Staff Sergeant Ronald Brown. Most people don't rec- remember their recruiter's names, or maybe they do in the beginning because they hate their recruiter. But but uh, I remember him thirty years later. Yeah, I had, I do. <laughs> you remember yeah, that guy? He's a yeah. seal. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. You That's the him. only reason I have because he whipped our ass before we got, got you in. Ready, yeah. Still calls He's, and check, checks in. He still calls and talks down to me. Uh-huh. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Freaking I would love to, I would love to get a hold of Ronald Brown because You found he, him? I haven't found him. Right, He's find freaking him now. Marines, dude. I need to find a Marine that I uh, had a, that I buddied up with officer type. Yeah. And I've been looking for him since we left Airborne. We went to Airborne school together. Yeah. And he dropped me off at Bragg. And I, and I lost contact with him, which is crazy. I feel like Marines are the worst at keeping t- in touch with everybody. Yeah, they don't care about that. <laughs> they don't. They just, they're just the hard, most hardcore. When it's kind of like the Vietnam yeah. Bulldogs, the, those guys, man, that's the hardest thing. Because look who trained them. Mm-hmm. Good God. <laughs> I mean, the reputation, then they went in, which was an ambush war. Who knew that? Yeah. I just learned that. The Vietnam was a complete ambush war. Every time they went out, there was something waiting on them. And yeah. it wasn't the other way around. No. And think about how tough you got to be. Then to come back and go through all that, that's why I was always taught to say, hey, welcome home to yeah. one of them. I, 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 I still do. We even when I speak publicly, I always give welcome home to the Vietnam vets. Marines, if you call them out on that, mm-hmm. if you see one of them in town, like an old timer get getting that line, you'd be like, hey, Marine, they will freaking stand <laughs> to it. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No, right, it's a yeah, thing. Right, yeah. You say something about American, call them on that Marine thing, and they will, there's something that triggers in there. I guess it's gunning. Says that to them, Marine, you freaking, and they will. You know, you know it's crazy, but, it, but it's awesome too. Like you have someone like from that generation that maybe spent, especially when, you know, we losing our World War II guys, we probably almost lost them all now, but Korea, like, like Vietnam, they did like two years in the service in their whole life. They got the hat, they mm-hmm. got the jacket, like the whole way they see the world, like through those lenses at two years of service it just shows how impactful like serving services. Can you imagine what that was like? like? Yeah. You're getting that kind of funnel. Oh yeah. yeah. Th- that kind of fire hose. Hey, here's your whole, everything in two years. Flop. <laughs> we had a good friend that was a um, World War II Marine, R.V. Bergen. He was, uh, there's part of the series, The Pacific is after, yeah, he's in after him. I and heard that name before. He awesome, just yeah. died he like in, within the last Before's three or four quarantine. years. Um, but he at 90 freaking years old, he would still wear his like Marine belt You buckle. could shave yeah. with the creases in that dude's <laughs> pants. They were so yeah. short. Hey, Tommy. <laughs> Tommy Ford, I still. Oh, yes. Yeah, Marine Corps oh, yeah. buckle. I mean, just freaking out there chopping that wood. 98, 94, whatever he was, He's man. He's old. Our staff, our staff rolls in like 9 o'clock. Tommy's been there since 6. Uh, Star- yeah. Starched out. Start head to toe. Head to yeah. toe legit, man. When they walked, they just cut the air, Beard's dude. on point, yeah. Yeah. With mustaches on point. I love it. <laughs> I love That's it. one thing. You can talk all the smack you want about the Marine Corps. I mean, I... Hopefully everyone knows who that's who's always had to rescue my ass. I got a <laughs> stepson kind of thing for him, right? Yeah. But fucking sharp, squared away when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Military bearing. Yeah. A freaking military bearing. When you call them on, they freaking they got it. Yeah, we, we we kinda messed it up in the recon community because we kinda that's we, tra- we try okay, we try to be a little relaxed then. That's that, that's the bridge <laughs> between us and y'all, right there. Yeah. Is when y'all come in. That's that, that's allowed, man. Going our hair so how along. does that work with Marines? When you go in as Force Recon, when you yeah. um, signed up, did you immediately sign up for that, or did you have to transition into that? In my day, you didn't. My day, you just said try out once you're in. Now there's a and the, you go to recruiter and you sign a recon contract, and then you uh, when you go to infantry school, you do boot camp, then infantry school for four weeks, then you go over a thing thing called BRPC, Basic Recon Prep Course which is like a, an assessment and selection mm-hmm. for a couple of weeks and uh, really just weeds everybody out. And then you go into a year pipeline. So the year pipeline is basic recon course, uh, then pre-scuba, combat dive, jump school, serious school, military free fall school. Mm-hmm. So after a year, you go to your unit and uh, you'll go to regular recon battalion and uh, you're schooled out and you're trained up, ready to go. That's just it. like going to SQT. Oh, so okay, it's, like okay. a, it's, it's like the same thing. Yeah, same thing. You're schooled up. You got a year All pipeline, right, you're schooled up. And then, what do they do with the dudes that when y'all they don't make it through? They just they go, needs in the Marine Corps. Most of them will go back to infantry school and finish out infantry. Just make them bad dudes, right? They just no. get hurt and all that. Everything's but like the the thing is, they'll probably actually a lot of people are worried about that. And I tell them, man, you you have this high GT score, so they'll give you the option to say, hey, you go back to infantry school, or you could go be you know, cyber security or like because you have the you have to have a high GT score to be a SEAL or recon yeah, yeah. at Green Beret. So they have a they usually give them. It's not like a Pen, like slapping the wrist penalization. It's like, hey, no. thanks for coming out. Like, yeah, it's completely different. Yeah, and I, and I, you can't understand this when you're young, mm-hmm. but like for if you got guys who by no fault of their own got injured or whatever, and they send them back over there, they'll motivate the other dudes to get 
to get their asses over there too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's by design. Yeah. You don't know that. They don't tell you that. Yeah. No. But that's the way it works. Well, in my day though, it was like you, you go to infantry school or communication school, then you take an indoctrination mm -hmm. and uh, then you go go to a rep program, recon indoctrination program, and then go to a basic recon course. And then once you're in a unit, you'll go to all these schools, jump, dive, free fall. Yeah. I was around, I was around for like, three four years before we went to free fall school so it took a while but now they're pipelined out oh, yeah, it's in there yeah. it's built in yeah, yeah. we know some of our great. guys on the team been there for 15 years and hadn't seen that yeah mm -hmm. and if you came in as a new guy and cut the line <laughs> woo, stand by that was yeah. like a thing yeah. i remember that so did yeah. you go in right after high school i did I, actually i didn't graduate high school that's why i say staff started brown so i'm so thankful i was 17 years old i was in such a bad position with my family falling apart i was living on my own and so i went to the recruiter and was like Hey, this is my situation. My brother died. My family fell apart. And uh, I, I'm trying to work and go to school. And he helped me get in without a high school diploma in 1993, which you were required to have one. And uh, I made a promise to him that I'd, after infantry school, I'd get my GED. And I did. And all these years later, I got MBA. Oh. Always joke when I'm speaking. I'm like, oh I, can't, I can't spell MBA, but I got one. But, uh, <laughs> How about yeah, that? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Most of our generation, guys, when they when they pop out from combat and they go back to college, they're like, hey, this is it's, this is such a hangout. It's not yeah. A, I ruined the curve. Yeah, it's so awesome when you find leaders like that recruiter that made one little you know slip in for you yeah. and look what you became. If he said no, like yeah, he what wrote. if you said f the military and you took another route? Like oh, that man, was awesome. Man, dude, they're the best used car salesmen there is. <laughs> I mean, that's you buy something off the lot that's got some dings and dents and nobody wants, and I'd be like, I can find a spot for you. But it used to be like that. Yeah, and they, they come back squared away. <laughs> Because you can tell the difference between a dog who's been trained and one who had. Like when they walk up, the way they stand and mm -hmm. everything, and that's all it is is discipline. You get that base. Someone said this the other day. He's like, you can teach somebody, a kid, every other skill set down here and don't teach him discipline and he won't do shit. Mm -hmm. You can only teach him discipline. He'll do all kinds of stuff. And he'll do every other thing by himself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's right. And the hardest part about doing that is when you become the father. Yeah. You got That's your one job. Not everybody else is. Just the one you got dealt with. Yeah. And if you do that, we're good. Yeah, See, you know, some, some just, and, you know, that's good. I, I'd never heard of that before. before. I hadn't that's, either. That's that's. Yeah. A, I had I had a father break that down for me one time. I was like, yeah, I, that makes sense. You should have led with that a long time. You know, you know, because with <laughs> yeah. us, man, it's like, hey, as soon as you tell me, yeah, and I and I see it, I'm good. It's not it's not our fault. If we're walking around. We don't know, right? But there's yeah. something about like so many people nowadays that are in positions like that, like that recruiter that just all they do is just follow the checklist yeah and yeah. that drives me crazy because there's so many people with potential that they just need a little bit of wiggle room to mm. get in there that's so. terrible it's hard because there's a checklist guy uh -huh. oh, there's a checklist soul <laughs> and whenever he shows up and gets put in the line and he he will make he's so adamant about that that the next dude up could be like us and he's like yeah. no no you got to yeah right and and it does it drives him crazy yeah that's usually when stuff starts to because <laughs> you don't let them do their thing yeah you naturally by design look like that and do that do your thing well if yeah. recruiter brown is still out there yeah listen we need a wanted post start, <laughs> right yeah yeah go old school that's yeah. awesome he was air wing too yeah. We, I don't know that this I'm sure it does exist in, in, in an official platform but I'm trying to create the platform to like hey man you need to find one of us it's not we, you come to this place so we can like yeah I know where he's at the central point yeah yeah, uh -huh. yeah yep. like when our DD214s you got guys who check check out just all I need is your number and then yeah. I can find anything I want yeah well you guys got to figure out in the teams you got the blood class number yeah we got yeah, all that yeah. that's what I'm saying <laughs> the biggest thing with it's the family it's crazy families, too because yeah. you bust people on that like I've busted people on oh, that yeah. Yeah. well she's better at it than well yeah. there's people that have <laughs> said oh yeah I did this and this and this and I was actually part of Red Wing or whatever and I'm like really I've never heard your like I you know, they if they were in the, the SEAL community, the I like I would think I'd them. hear their name. They're like, yeah, I was Bud's class 3,630 <laughs> or whatever. I'm like, you're full of shit. <laughs> you're yeah. totally it's, full of it's shit. Funny, most of us military, we were, uh, I was like horrible in math, you know, that kind of thing. But I remember every number in the military. There's more numbers in the military than you can even remember, stick yeah. at. Yeah. That's all we know. Yeah. <laughs> and this, this is like uh, things that I remember like, that I had to learn verbatim that pop up. I was speaking, remember I was speaking in church the other day. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I, and yeah. I, the word, I said the word panic and I'm like, or, or, yeah. the quest. 
That's, yeah, McQuist. That's what you yeah. learned from. And me. I said to her, "Panic!" And I just read. I, I, my mind just went to the definition of the sudden overwhelming terror. <laughs> yeah. The sudden overwhelming terror that destroys a person's capacity for self help. Like he just, he just like, and I hadn't, I hadn't said that in like twenty years. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> definition was like. <laughs> teaching my kids something last night and I was like hey say it like this this is why we remember it she was she was doing that too I was like man that, that's why that's there yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody knows that the key to someone's heart always lies in some delicious comfort food if you're looking for the best gift ideas for birthdays holidays, or even for yourself, look no further than ButcherBox. ButcherBox gives you the peace of mind in knowing that you're always getting the most premium quality meat, 100% grass-fed beef, organic chicken, and all seafood is caught in the wild. Nothing they serve has any antibiotics or added hormones. You can get this delivered straight to your doorstep for free if you live inside the continental U.S. That's right, no hidden or surprise fees. They even provide the best recipe inspiration with tips and tricks so you can cook up the tastiest, most mouth-watering meals for you and your guests. ButcherBox is offering our listeners one of their best deals yet. 100% grass-fed chuck roast and a whole organic chicken for free when you join, plus an additional $20 off your first box. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash TNQ and use code TNQ to get a 100% grass-fed chuck roast and a whole chicken free in your first box plus $20 off. That's butcherbox.com slash TNQ and use code TNQ to get this very special deal. Awesome. Okay, so you get in, you got a great recruiter, and then... Then what? Then, then I, you know, go through infantry school, go through, become a recon marine, and uh, and then I do all these schools and all this training, and then there's no wars because I went in in 1993, and uh, and uh, you know I, I did we did some counter drug operations like a, called JTF six operations and down in Mexico and on the border and stuff like that, but no wars and yeah, that's and, what we were doing. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was kind of that, that, those fact, years. Most of you you couldn't even like one year was like we're I don't even know where they were. Like right. they spread us out to the winds. They find jobs for us. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. Kept kept us busy and kept during us busy. Time. And then the wars condense us. Yeah. yeah. And then nine eleven happened. I was a sergeant at Third Force Recon Company. I was a, uh, uh, I was the uh, actually in, in his billet that he's in now. I was I was a free fall team leader there and uh and being a team leader at Third Force. I'm like, man, really? When this one jumped off, you were <laughs> running the stuff, huh? Yeah. So I was like, my, my life's about to change. Oh, uh, it- and uh. And I, I obviously we wanted it to. We were like, let's go, oh, yeah. let's go do this. Were you married? Yeah, I, I was. I got married when I was eighteen. We were eighteen and nineteen years old, so we've been married. Kathy's experienced Everything. the whole thing, yeah, from the beginning to end. That's and, awesome. And uh, where, where's she at? Yeah, yeah. we need her <laughs> on here. Come back yeah, home, bro. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want the real story, the wild, yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. yeah, uh, I mean, she she's been through a lot, and I mean, if you guys you know know the whole story of. You know, I went there. Uh, I tried out for uh, that JSOC task force to go with one of our premier units and, and work with a lot of your guys. And and uh, privilege of lifetime as a Marine to get to go represent the Marine Corps there. And I and, uh, did eight deployments that way and and, uh, and came home and dealt with, you know, after, you know, 15 friends, burying 15 friends. And uh, our confirmation, our, our operation got compromised. And, and um, you know, I ended up being abducted by SI and, uh, and, had a V-bid driven in my house and uh, 12, uh, 12 of our guys were, were rolled up. 10 of them were killed, Afghans. Uh, and, you know, these, these guys are my brothers. Like I lived in their homes. I played soccer with their kids. They're my friends. And, and uh, so I, I, I ended up just dealing with major like anxiety, panic attacks and uh, came home, got diagnosed with PTSD and got read out of my program, which was, you know, just soul sucking for me. What year was that? In 2000, April of 2007. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and I was just man, I was de- dealing with these debilitating panic attacks, ashamed of what happened, and uh, and so <clears throat> so uh, I uh, where did I you, went, when you punched that, where'd you come back to? What's that? What, what? When you came out of the military, did you come back here? So I was I was I had already switched a contract, so I came I was so I was a contractor, so there was no like transition out for me. It was yeah, it was not. It was just like boom. I was so like, right, that's right that's a done. Great point. 
Because yeah. a lot of people, the guys, there was this funny thing that happened with us. Yeah. Because hmm? just to break it down real fast, the, when you talk to a veteran, when they say their war, that's like saying their name, their identity, right. their tag. Mm-hmm. Right. And you immediately, and, and something comes with that. Mm-hmm. You freaking know it. So you had the Vietnam guys. After that, you had Storms and Shields. Right. Which trained, which was an interim in between that. Yeah. And then our guys came online. Yeah. And I mean, we trained in terror. Just, what, what kind of war you guys fight? Well, man, we were going against terrorists. What kind of operators do you think we are? Well, something happened in the middle of us mm-hmm. where, they were, where our guys got out and went into that civilian contract side. Yeah. There wasn't a detox moment. No. Matter of fact, it was kind of the military's link to a detox because those guys were civilians, but still yeah. fight. You know, it was like having a cool cousin yeah. come in and help you whip some ass, dude. Yeah. They could get away, get us some stuff. For me, it was my same exact same job. Like I went, my, my, I had to, I got yeah, a contract exactly. at a command. So I'm like, went from, went from staff sergeant paid to, oh, to dude, contract paid doing the exact, exact, exact oh, same man. job. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so I thought it was great, but it, it, where it wasn't great was that when I needed help, oh, then it was yeah. just well, like, there's that. you're done. Yeah. And, uh, well, even in the military, I feel like if it was kind of before 2000 and, 10 that you were getting out there was really no good transition no no they finally like in the seal that was they it finally yeah, started was doing yeah. <laughs> nico that was transition. at least that i mean which yeah. isn't going to solve problems but at least they're getting like a read on what guys are going through kind of i think that was post yeah. 2000 it's about 2010 2011 when they started doing nico at least but I feel like before that, like when Marcus got out. I was say, what year was for you? It was 2008. Eight, seven, seven, eight. Eight. What year was Red Wing? Yeah. Five. Five, yeah. yeah. I went back afterwards. Yeah, he went yeah. to Ramadi after that. And then, that. um, yeah. Uh, dude, freaking worse, man. Yeah. yeah. It was awesome. I mean, it was, yeah. a, you know, I'm talking yeah, about yeah. kicking this. But we still, like, just a year ago, we were still trying to straighten out his yeah. retirement medical paper. Dude, I hadn't heard it said like that, but literally our rotation cycle out was to do that like you went yeah. offline to the contract that was your That's boot right. camp back yeah, yeah same yeah, thing yeah and and at, at that unit that was, that was that the plan unit. for everybody i yeah. even thought i was like okay so after right. i get done with this then this is what i have to do yep. we follow yeah. each other yeah it's like an unwritten yeah, yeah exactly it's yeah. like all right what Everybody's am i supposed to do you just look to the guy's like well, what's he whatever he's doing yeah. i guess That's what, what doing, we're doing yeah. man yeah and i guess we're doing that especially in you guys community in that unit i was at specifically everyone did that half the guys there were and so i was super privileged i felt super privileged to have the opportunity to do that but it bit me in the end. And so to answer your question, I was already living here. So this is where I stayed, opened my jiu-jitsu gym, spent about three years like, you know, professional fighting and teaching jiu-jitsu. And on the surface, it looked like everything was fine. But, you know, I, I crashed and I ended up in, a, in an affair. We separated, filed for divorce. And, uh, and then in 2010, I had to take my life. And then, um, and then some amazing people came around me and here in this community, the church, Woods Edge Church down in so- southern area of the Woodlands there and came around me and just helped us to restore our family. and and rebuild my faith and uh and my life was just radically transformed and that's when i started the mighty oaks foundation to help others that's awesome so So how'd your wife handle that well this uh you know we when we were separated i and uh i was in in that i was in the closet i would go i would try to build up the courage to to take my life and i had had the port glock 22 pistol 40 caliber pistol and i put my family pictures on the floor around me and uh and I tried to build the courage to pull that trigger, but my my oldest son Hunter at the time he was he was thirteen and he was the only one that had a key to my apartment, and so I, I that I had this like I believe it was divine like thought like someone's gonna find me, and uh, and so as I was trying to build the courage to do that, he, uh, I would think of him finding me like he's somebody's gonna hear a gunshot, somebody's gonna I'm gonna be show up missing, so he would be the one to help open the doors. So that was enough to pump the brakes, and but I was in such a dark place that I was so determined like to rid them of that burden of, of what I was putting them through, and so. Uh, one, I was in that closet and my wife knocked on the door and I wasn't going to answer it. And, uh, and I heard Kathy's voice and I kind of panicked. I, I don't know why, because she would never came to my closet, but I hid the gun under a blanket. And I was so mad that she was there. It sounds twisted, but I like went to the door and just started berating her for being there, interrupting me and doing that. And uh, she's not a very calm arguer, by the way. <laughs> but in, in this moment, she was pretty calm and she, she asked me a question that you know changed my life. She's like, how could you do everything you did? And the Marine Corps, we were 17, 18, we met. She saw me go to recon school and all the schools and training and workups, you know, deployment workups and all the, the crazy stuff that we do. Talk about discipline, like the discipline to what to and in military and fighting and cutting weight and all that stuff. She's like, How could you do all of that? And when it comes to your family, you'll quit. And mm. uh, and uh, yeah, never quit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she was right. I've been I've been successful at professional things in my life, but when it came to the most important things like being a husband, being a father, 
being a young 17 year old kid that staff Sergeant Brown gave me that chance to go and make something of my life. And I quit all those things, including my will to live. So, uh, that challenge, uh, really was a pretty cool being called a quitter is a pretty soul cutting word to me. And mm -hmm. that challenge really, uh, made me jump back in the fight. And, uh, and thankfully I, I was, I, I think God orchestrated to putting the right people around me, surrounding me by the right people to challenge me and help bring some accountability in my life to actually finally get well. Did she do that? Or did you already know the people that she did that? She was going there at church in the woodlands. I, I was not interested in God or uh, faith or church or anything like that, but I wanted somebody outside of my circle. Cause I was in, I was, I was ranked number six in the world at that time as a fighting uh, and out, out of this area. I was probably like one of the you know top fighters out of this area at that time. So like everyone was around me telling me everything I wanted to hear, not what I needed to hear. So I didn't have good accountability and I was, I was very aware of that. And in fact, I was kind of em embracing that. And so I had to ask someone, I wanted someone outside of my circle. And so I asked Kathy, is there someone at this church you're going to that could help hold me accountable to the decision? And, uh, and she introduced me a man named Steve Toth, who's actually, I don't know if you guys oh, know yeah, Steve. Oh yeah, the state rep. Yeah. And so Steve, he wasn't in politics at the time. He was just an elder on call at the church. And I met with him at a Starbucks coffee shop. And, uh, and I had this perfect like five paragraph order, op order, if I was going to fix my life. And I like slid it over to him. Like, Hey, check this out. Show it to my wife so I could win her back. And he, uh, he slid it back over to me and told me I was going to fail. And I remember being like pretty offended. Cause I didn't even know who he was. And he's telling me I'm going to fail. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, you ever read this? And he's like, he, he's tapped in that paper. And he said, this plan doesn't have anything to do with your relationship with God. I'm, I'm not going to waste your time. I'm not let you waste mine. Mm -hmm. And at that time in my life, I'd, I'd been on other medications. I'd been to VA programs, civilian programs, I had professional success, financial success. And you know, some of those things are good. Some of those things are bad, but none of those things worked. And so uh, it kind of led us to uh, saying we have mighty oaks. If what you're doing is working, then why not try something different? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I made a decision to surrender my life to God, uh, became a Christian. And Steve mentored me for an entire year in like biblical living. And what, what that really meant for me was like, I had, can't, it led me to this realization that all these bad things that happened to me, I remember losing like, you know, like Foster Harrington, who's, we served together for 10 years before he was killed. He was killed in Al Alabar province in, in 2004 in, uh, in, our, in Iraq. And, that's that, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when he was killed, I was like, I was so pissed off. Like I was like, I remember just being so angry because like one of the best human beings on the planet. And he was, just, he was one of those guys that really wanted to make a change in like these countries and, and help. And he just had a heart for that when other people was like, eh, you, you know, who cares about Iraqis or Afghans? Like he, he was like one of the guys that's always like wanting to do the right thing. And, uh, and like, so all these bad things, my childhood uh, deployments, like all these bad things that happened to me, those things didn't lead me to be in that closet with a pistol man when it led me there. Well, the choices I was making in response to that and what Steve was teaching me through his mentorship was, hey, let, yeah, you're going to deal with anxiety, depression, anger, but you can respond to it in a better way that's going to you know, lead you in the right place. And that's what the Bible did for me. And, and it led me to restoration and hope and ultimately to find a new purpose. And that purpose really manifested for me in a, in a the starting of Mighty Oaks Foundation, just wanting to pay it forward to others. And uh, obviously, we'd never had any idea that in the last 12 years, I've spoken to half a million troops now and, you know, and, uh, and, with our programs, I speak at Marine Corps boot camp every every quarter. I've did NSW conferences, and and uh, and then we have a recovery program where where uh, our friend Ben worked at, and and uh, where we have we do thirty five camps a year, um, and and we've helped you know thousands of people there, and and it's just been amazing to to watch you know just think all these other warriors who've been through the same thing I've been through get better, and then be in a position to help the next guy and just pay it forward and pay it forward and pay it forward. And that's that's what we you know. That's what I think the real solution to this is. I mean, obviously, I believe that God's like a centerpiece solution because I think a lot of things we deal with are spiritual wounds and it requires a spiritual solution. But the people to, to deliver that are our peers uh, and to be able to not just get well, be in a position to help the next person and, and pay it forward. So that makes it real. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This uh, was delivered to me. Yep. <laughs> yep. I mean, it was like, look at you. Yeah. One of the most terrifying things to walk the planet of Earth right now. You think your neighbor's going to come over and talk to you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Are you kidding me right now? I mean, that's what you decided to be. Yeah. And spent a lifetime doing it. Every yeah. qual that went into it made it. Yeah. If you don't have something better than yeah. you to keep you in check, your ass yeah. will get off the limb with it. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly right. And at a young age, you don't know that. I feel like white dudes have to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, and I just do. I just feel like yeah. I'm like my brothers, man, they like know that already. Like yeah. we, I feel like we have to learn that. Yeah. So you get to that point to where you're the most dangerous thing down here. Mm hmm. Even Jesus had to come into a woman. Mm -hmm. They're not the most dangerous thing down here, but they're the toughest thing down here, and they're designed <laughs> to love the most deadliest thing. Mm -hmm. And we still talk to them the way we do. Yeah. How about that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Can you can you believe that, that, that we even do that? I, I can't yeah. even. I, when someone told me like that, I was like, "Hey, man, every time they they see you, they want to love on you and take care of you 
and then something gets a hold of you, badass, mm -hmm. and then you go home and beat up on your wife. I, I thought, remember Seal, all, all these backgrounds, and stuff, what's so fucking tough about you, man? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, like, when they break it down on you, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah so you are, man, yeah. you're the dangerous thing down here. So now I got to turn around and teach, you know, it's this is where we learn. It's like yeah. to receive, reflect, and now we have to respond. But the, the irony with, with our generation is there has to be some dark humor in it. Yeah, yeah. So the situations that we get put in aren't designed for us to do what we're really, really good at. You got to hit them with the articulate. Yeah. And like, hey, I, I and, and the reason you you look like that is so you can just make sure you scare the shit out of them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. And then you have the stories to back it up because yeah. overall, inside the, this country, man, yeah. they, they, they're good with us. Yeah. Remember what everyone else on the planet thinks of us. So yeah. with my you know, own. all it can switch. You got to control it. Yeah. That's the, that was the most valuable lesson we learned. I mean, you got to, you got to be able to remember that part, what you really are, as opposed to what you're trying to do is an opposite thing. Well, I, exactly what you're talking about. I use that to keep people at distance for a long time. Like I, yeah. I came back from Afghanistan. I didn't talk. Now I public speak and write books and stuff. I didn't tell anybody I was in, I didn't want anybody to know I was in the military. Uh, I just wanted, we're taught that. I want to like shut that, that chapter in my life and move on. And uh, now I'm going to try to build myself to be like this macho, like fighter. And, and, uh, but, but, uh, I, I didn't want anybody to speak into my life. I'm like, and I would position myself to where I didn't want to, I didn't want any accountability. And so I had to be willing to make myself, you know, open to that. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they made me do it. Yeah. They put me on there. I didn't have a choice. Yeah. And when that, when they do that, I, I, I think that's important for us too. It's like, I do really well when someone tells me what to do. Yeah. Like when there's a mission statement and an order, and especially if there's a, the team's doing it. Yeah. I, when we're by ourselves, we kind of idle around. Because that, that when we were by ourselves, if there was a mission going on, bro, we'd go get into something. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Even if, just, even, if, even if it was a bar fight, right? Yeah, <laughs> get right. Something. I mean, just something. <laughs> yeah. So that's the toughest thing for us. And not only that, we were well trained in it. It took yeah. us out of the country and threw us in Babylon. <laughs> took us to the beginning. When everyone else got paradise, when everything came online, the tech and everything was good here, I mean, we weren't here. Right. Mm -hmm. We missed that. So a lot of the guys when they come back, you can see it in them. And when they get back, man, I tell people, man, for every 10 you're in, it takes two to detox. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And if you got your boys around you, especially if you cut from the same cloth, and if you're not, that doesn't matter because most of us are bastards <laughs> and we enter off. Yeah. Especially when we're in the bot in the sandbox. Man, guys are just you would work with them for years and not even know that they were in a different branch of service. Yeah. That was crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's you know what you know one thing I'm I don't want to get off subject, but one of the things I've seen lately and I've experienced with this book and I and I've witnessed from afar, you dealt with it before. It's how much we support each other, but, but but when a guy gets out and transitions away and starts being successful or does something, gets a platform, how we eat, we cannibalize each other. It, it's we awful. go after each other and, and like, why do we do that to it's each other? Absolutely awful. And it's usually it's, the guys that are like still active or, or mm -hmm. just getting out yeah. that just pounce on yeah. whoever. I've, I mean, I've seen it. Seen, seen with Marcus, Tim and Kennedy. I, yeah. And uh, it's just. Mike Glover. Who doesn't? Instructors. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when our peers talk, no one ripped me. I mean I'll get on seals and they'll tear my ass I expect that yeah yeah <laughs> if you're not then there's a problem <laughs> you can tell when team uh, and that's military wide especially yeah. if you speak the language yeah like oh he was talking smack what do you say <laughs> really right yeah. he's like wait what do you say yeah because yeah, there's, there's there's a good difference. way there's, there's a, a difference. difference there's yeah. a complete and the problem with with uh social media is there's no you can't see the flare right right you don't know what it's wrapped in yeah when it's delivering that message and people get bent out. i got team guy i got the baddest men on the planet of earth they get upset over something they'll read in an op board on that phone mm -hmm. and i'm like really you get mad about that? You don't know who said that. Man, oh, he damn gets on to me. Dude, if I, I get that's my one thing with y'all. Something I read, he's like, "You read it on a phone." Yeah, what do you care? You're fine. <laughs> y'all don't care. People say y'all y'all do the talking. Uh, yeah. Everyone else listens to y'all now. That's where we're at. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. but you can get wrapped up in it, especially if it's your life. That thing right there is. It does yeah. happen. That's so like, that should be in the vault. That's like an M4, <laughs> man. Or <an> explosion. <laughs> well, it's, it could be dangerous. It can, yeah. Yeah, the worst. Critics are our own teammates and peers, yeah. but I love those guys. Mar <laughs> I love Marcus. Marcus yeah. never bothered him. He, it never bothered me. I don't. Know. It bothered <laughs> me because yeah. I'm like, I thought we were close. Like yeah. we you know, are. So, <laughs> it. 
I definitely take offense to it, but he does not. He's so good at Hello. just letting it just roll off his I, back. I could use some lessons from him right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's what this is. Just let it roll off your back. Yeah. Like, you get, me, I just always look at it like, hey, if you and I are standing somewhere yeah, and somebody walked up on us, and even if they did get it out of their mouth, what? what? Yeah. I mean, what? what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been yeah. over there where they're trying to kill us every day yeah. in our sleep. You yeah. know what I'm talking about? Much less. And everything out of their mouth is how I was. We're taught from birth that everybody hates us. And yeah. you know what? When that's it comes true. down to it, that person that's talking shit, if they got into a bind. We go save them. You oh, would yeah. Go sure. ones have to go 100%. Them. 100%. 100%. So, oh, and I know that. So yeah. I'm just kind of like, all right, whatever. Yeah, and they like would come we, for us. Yeah. And they would still do it. It's yeah. kind of like the guy. That w- it's just like, man, look. I, and, and I'm not kidding about that. Everyone is taught to hate us from birth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't ever forget it. Yeah. No matter how much we bleed, we collect scars in this family, came down here to bleed. Mm-hmm. No matter how much you do it, man, they're still going to hate your ass. Yeah. It's a dysfunctional family, yeah. but you yeah. still have each other's back. We're the outside yeah. boys. Yeah. Yeah. That's where they keep us, man. You know, God's got a table full of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, just checking. <laughs> so when you started the Binding Oaks Foundation, did your church help you build the platform? How did they you did. actually... They got, you know, Pastor Jeff Wells and, and the Woodland, he's still there. Uh, he's Talk about him. Pastor he's, He's an amazing human being. A, a little background on Pastor Jeff Wells. He's ran for an Olympic team. Uh, the year he got boycotted, uh, sponsored by Nike. Came in second in the Boston Marathon by like a, by like a second. Oh, wow. Uh, and, uh, wait, wait. Uh, really? Yeah, he's an incredible, incredible human being. You guys know who he is? It's, I don't yeah, know. Woods, I don't know. At, Woods Edge Church. So so that's that's where we go to church now. But that church just really got behind us. And they believed that. I mean, honestly, they, should, they had no business getting behind us. Me and Kathy were not in a position to help others. We were still bleeding ourselves, but they just really felt that God was burning our hearts to, to go far and do this. And oh, they were the patch. Yep. Mm-hmm. And they uh they 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 uh, wrapped their arms around us, launched us out to do this. And uh, you know, twelve years later, um, it's been, you know, amazing, amazing opportunity to serve so many people. And so uh, we still get to do it. The holidays are my favorite time of year. It's prime time for seeing friends and family, going on vacations, and even giving gifts. It always leaves me with the great feeling until I'm back home and realize that I might have spent a little too much money. Luckily, our friends over at Navy Federal Credit Union have the easiest way to pay down credit card debt. You can get a low intro APR on balance transfers with their Platinum credit card, which is their lowest rate card and it's easy to get. I've been using the Platinum card for a few months now and it's actually really helped me stay on top of my finances and I really think it could help you out too. And anybody working on home DIY activities, Navy Federal can help you get started on your next home improvement project as well. They offer a home equity line of credit with easy access to funds when you need them at a variable rate. You can learn all about this and more at NavyFederal.org. Do y'all, do y'all take, um, like, how does it work? Because you don't own all the ranches that you right. do the retreats at. Are people just offering that up for they, the They do. Yeah, or? so, we, so we, have, we have really four things that we do. We have a resiliency program where primarily me, I, I go to bases around the world and speak to troops on PTSD, suicide prevention, Who do you roll with when you do that, man? Are you USO in that or now? No, I'm not, I don't do it. We just run through my ranch. track you with so that yet? Directly. The a fighter and all that? They didn't put you on that? No, they've, they've tried to, but uh, to do like a USO tour and I think in Afghanistan one time and I, and it was just okay because like who are you with <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah who'd you go with man because some yeah. of them have a blast yeah, yeah. Well, you're just so yeah I just do I just did yeah. it through ourselves and and uh and and we like I said at Marine Corps boot camps had me for every quarter for eight years now and uh and then we write res, uh resources so like some of our books path to resiliency truth by PTSD we've given away about three hundred fifty thousand copies and then our recovery program which you t- you're talking about our legacy programs. We have five ranches, California, Ohio, Virginia, two in Texas. And those ranches, uh, two of them are exclusive for us, our two main ones, California and Ohio. And so we don't own them, but they were built and are exclusive to yeah, us. Sure. Cool. So we have, the one in California, for example, is 25,000 acres, about $10 million facility that uh, Mr. Wayne Hughes Jr., the public storage family, built for us. And uh, we do- Great the, family. Oh, amazing people. And of the, of the 35 camps that we do a year, they're five days long, of the 35 we do a year, 17 of their, of their California. That's right. And uh, and so active duty service members come on PTAD orders, veterans come, uh, first responders, and, and we have a spouses program as How well. How do you find them? How do we what? How do you find them? Uh, well, man, honestly, they, they found us. Yeah. They find, we, we, we get- we So get, recommend, it's yeah, the words out there. We're, get, we're getting like, I think last year we got 1,800 applications. Oh, okay. And so we're doing, so 
We do about a thousand per year uh, that go through and we pay for everything, including travel. Mm -hmm. So it's about $5 million a year in programming. And uh, honestly, in the la um, we always need support, but in the last 12 years, it's been amazing. As we grew, uh, the money has always came because we just got, I mean, you guys know from what you do, we have amazing country of patriots that love our troops and oh. have supported it. And it's been incredible. Hey, the Vietnam guys had it. If, our, if my dad and your dad had, mm -hmm. a set of, had to set that in, mm -hmm. if, if one of them had to do it. Yeah. It, it was them. They did it. Because when we got back, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they're like, I, I can't even drive. Yeah. Like you and I have tried to just be the baddest things on the planet of Earth. The minute we came back hurt or busted yeah. up, like, we got you. Yeah. And, and, and there's so many, I mean, there's 43, 44,000, I'm right. So basically everybody. Yeah. They, most people don't know how to do it. Everyone yeah. wants to help. Yeah. What a great country you live in where when you come back like that, and Americans are great about one thing. If they watch you get your ass whipped for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they know it. Yeah. As soon as they know it. They'll take care of you. You're good. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it, it's been it's been uh, incredible just to be just to watch how people you talk about people coming together in unity. Mm -hmm. um, there's people that follow me on social media like don't like w where I stand conservatively, but when we do efforts like this Afghanistan evac effort, they're like, "Hey, I don't like you, but where can I support?" They'll tell you that. Yeah, they'll say it just like that. Yeah. I, I, man, I don't even like anything about you, man. But where, I'm can, where can I support? Yeah, what you what you right, doing? Bro. You're doing a good. Yeah, you're doing a good thing. Yeah, great. Yeah, and uh, so. Yeah, man, fire doesn't like water. You know, there's some yeah. things down here that don't get. It's not. Yeah. It's not a lot. The words mean something different. Yeah. It's like, man, they just don't coalesce. They can't grow next to each yeah. other. I always yeah. look at it like that. Since Mojo got up in D.C., he was talking about. I have been asking about all the congressmen. Yeah. And he's like, you know what? He goes, everyone I run into, regardless of what you see, he goes, when they turn it on, they can turn it on. Mm -hmm. And when they turn it off, and we're walking around and it's business as usual, he's like, "Man, they're straight up." He's like, "It's it's it's really something yeah. to see. They're professionals, adults, yeah. like, and and that's good. That is good." Yeah. And I'm like, "Jump on his back!" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really, I was like, "No more killing, yeah. no more killing." Okay, yeah. you can't do that I'm like, anymore. You gotta yeah. choke him out. Come yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's been, I, there's been a few Congress members I walked through when I was over over the Capitol, and I'm like, seeing him walking in the hall, and I just want to stick my leg out and trip him. Oh, right. bro, yeah. <laughs> that's the Cajun in us. I right? really think that's Y'all are bad. Y'all are worse. <laughs> yeah. The fire. Next on somebody, dude. The fiery Cajun. Like, what do they get do about it? What do they get do about it? I, I mean, know. they get up and I'm come, like, man. Even your Congress and the Senators are great <laughs> now that you have, man. They're fired up. Yeah. yeah. We were at dinner the night before Morgan was, well, before they were supposed to get sworn in, but uh ended up being five days later but we go to dinner that night before i'm like, okay if you see this person do this if you see this person <laughs> he just shook his head at me he's like you're a little fired up <laughs> i was like get him good with this state this state and this state i man. said that's yeah. the cajun in me i just yeah. get yeah get, get the cajun fire <laughs> yeah it's a thing there's two more things we do my dios one is uh policy wise we've taken the success of faith-based programs and and taking them to you know testify before congress and senate and and getting successful uh policy back in place for faith-based programs. In 2009, pre actually, President Bush signed a, the Opportunity Faith Initiative in 2001. 2009, President Obama signed a, a, a policy to override that and take funding away from faith-based programs and put all the money in clinical, and this problem got worse. And so in 2016, I was able to speak to candidate Trump and ask him if he'd over override that. Obama did that? Obama did that in 2009. And, uh, and they, they shifted a lot of money, all that money to clinical programs, stood up, put billions of dollars, stood up about 1,500 new clinical programs, and the suicide rate from went from 16 to 22 yeah, right after that. So so when I, I had, I was you tracking think, that. You think they're tracking their data? No, I don't know if they in are the not. Clinical, <laughs> oh, I yeah, hope so. in the clinical side, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, they're changing. I hope you're keeping yeah, stats. Yeah, because mm -hmm. like two years ago. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing it yeah. now. Yeah, so I, in 2016, I was before candidate Trump, and I got a chance to ask him a question. That's what I asked him. If you become president, Will you uh, override the Opportunity Faith Initiative and bring faith-based programs back? He said yes, and uh, I got the chance to be become the chairman of the White House's faith-based coalition for that, and and he signed that executive order in 2018. In addition to that, we uh, we worked on a lot of bipartisan policy. We got a lot of stuff done on the on the faith-based program side for VA and DOD, and I got to I got to advise uh, uh, Dep Deputy Secretary uh, Pam Powers of the oh. VA on, on that pot side. And then the last thing we do is. We do a, we, we take our programs that we've been successful with here and we take them to international partners around the world, uh, allies around the world. And so right now, I, I've been to Ukraine 10 times since February. Oh my so, God. Uh, Talk about that. Yeah. So um, yeah. originally went out there. How did you get, okay. how did you get in? 
Yeah, the, first the time. original time. I just drove in. I just drove. <laughs> I figured it was something. I, yeah, was I just like, drove man, in. I, was like, in I mean, there like, was nobody bro, stopping people from going in. I didn't think so. I was <laughs> like, like, what you like do, the, man? the line was seven about... days coming one way. Boom. But take <laughs> us back to like that day. Are you watching? It I mean, because I got an idea how you yeah. got in, bro. But, <laughs> just but drove are you in. just sitting on the couch watching on the news and you're like, I'm gonna go? No, we we had just got done with the. We had still had everybody in place, all of our team in place from the uh, Afghanistan evacs. And so one of our guys, uh, he's in the book of Sea Spray. He's uh, you know former Green Beret and and had spent some time with our premier government intelligence agency. So he's a very experienced guy. And so uh, he did a lot with us in Afghanistan. So he went ahead of time, and he was in he was in Ukraine like days before the invasion. And so we knew it was coming, and we were thinking, hey, how could we how could we help? It's a lot different than Afghanistan. Afghanistan people can go in to help but here you could drive a bus across the border open the door and people get in so mass evacs wasn't somewhere we could help so we were looking at some different things we could do to help so one was be you know strategic uh very strategic evacuations of people that couldn't self-evacuate and the other would be uh we identified that when the communication infrastructure went down all these ngos that were helping would be in the dark and so we we wanted to build the communications infrastructure in a clandestine like network for communications and, and and distribute that and track it. So that's what we went in there to do. Oh. And uh, so we, we build that in, in days. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So we go ahead. Yeah, let's say, so that, that's how, so I remember my son's back in the States. He's wanting to go and I'm like, okay, I need you to go like, uh, iridiums, uh, GPS, GPSs, go tennis for like the clandestine. Uh, that's square away. And, and we just, no built, one thinks of that. Yeah, because that's, I mean, what's the first damn thing people can't communicate? This. Gr- a com grid. Yep. What, who, who could save the day? Somebody could roll in there and throw one up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we did. We did. We did within the first weeks of that happening. And we put, we put 3,000, about 3,000 kits out. Tra- we could track where every kid is. That's cool. And man. so instead of us going to help, having to go help everybody, we could say, oh, this guy's over here. He can yeah. move you. That's and what so, helps that. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so we did and that. Food and, then, and f- yeah, all the, all the other go, logistics man. and infrastructure. So we did that. And then we were there in place when Benjamin Hall was heard if you guys know fox News, yeah. yes. Hall. Yeah. and so the pentagon contacted us uh the special operations liaison uh, liaison officer for one of the neighboring european countries i don't want to say which one contacted us and uh and then a fox news contacted us all at one time within minutes and said you know hey uh benjamin hall's there we don't know who else he's there with his cameraman and his correspondent and we, they were kiev was under attack at the time and and knowing u.s military or government intelligence agencies are not allowed to go in to get him and uh Ukrainians can't take care of him. He's going to die. So I remember C. Spray. Oh, shit. Yeah. C. <laughs> C- Spray said, hey, yeah. there's an American there. He's, uh, he's catastrophically wounded. Um, we don't know the status of the other ones, but he has a wife at home and two little girls. Uh, he's, if we don't go get him, he's going to die. So we were like, everyone was like, let's, yeah. go. let's, let's roll. And we, uh, we rolled in and, 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 and went in there and C. Spray and, and Bo. So we'll add a bonus that they're good. That, that, I'm not saying you got to treat us any better than anybody else, but they show respect. Yeah. Yeah. And you're damn right. We get we get your, get him get him yeah, too. Yeah, got him and and we, we got him out. And obviously, you get, everybody knows he, he lost his legs, his hand, and and uh, an eye. Okay, so uh, yeah, he did right. Yeah, yeah. He's, and he's he's doing Have good you now. Seen him? Okay, so yeah, he's he's ask. doing good. He just I think he just released his book. Yeah, and, uh, last week. And then uh, and then uh, we we went we were not going to go back to get Pierre, his cameraman, who's like 25 year war correspondent all through Afghanistan. He, I think he covered part of your story. And Probably. and so Pierre Pierre is a. Uh, Pierre was like really loved and they wanted us to get his body, but I'm like, Kiev was like getting rocketed. Like, and uh, so we were, we were not going to go get him, but his wife showed up, Michelle, and she's like, I want my husband. And we were oh like, my gosh. okay. So I went, I went and we went in and, uh, and actually he, when we got to him, he was in an amb- he was in a hearse and they had his coffin. Of course we had to identify him and he, it was done like, he was placed with like real dignity and, and, uh, and they had a Irish flag in the back cause he's from Ireland. Yeah. You know, our flags, we put stars over the head, stripes right, yeah, down to the feet. And I'm so I was like kind of I kind of like got a little flustered. I'm like, man, we got to do this right. So uh, I looked on Google like how to do you know the green, the, the white, and, red, and orange. Dude, and, and talk we, about yeah. that came into your mind that squared away. I wanted, I wanted it to be. I wanted to be. I wanted to be right. You know. Dude. So we took some some rigorous tape and we right? put it on the side of his coffin. No shit. Uh, and we put it on the side of his coffin and me and C Spray like got it right and uh, and then then we we're gonna take him out of our car and ratchet strap him in the back of our car. And I'm like, you know what? Like this looks like dignified to deliver to his wife. So I told the guy, I'm like. How how much do you want for your hearse? And he's like, it's not for sale. And I'm like, you mm. understand? Yeah, like, sale, I'm like, either either we're taking it, or yeah, you, yeah. you're gonna get on this phone right That's now. That's what that uh, means. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you get on the phone with Fox News right now, and you can score a deal. Yeah. And uh, and he got off. He was smiling, and I seemed to give him a good deal. That's and, a great story, man. Drove, drove him back. Yeah. 
So you just got in the hearse, and you where'd you drive it to? Uh, to Krakow, Poland. Dude, you went and, and stole the hearse and brought somebody back. That <laughs> yeah, is a yeah. great yeah. story. So, yeah, he's and uh, you know his his wife obviously was just devastated, but but uh, it was it was it was real, it was really a belt to deliver him that way. And and, uh, and well and, done, man. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. awesome. That's a good job. Yeah, we and, you know, uh, and then we, then we st- we so we've been there now. What we doing? We taking a mighty oak spiritual resiliency program. And we are going to the front lines and uh, like past the front lines. We've been past like two hours past the Russian line to like special operations troops. And we, uh, so you're we taking bring the boys them, back in. Yeah, we bring small teams, like two, three man teams. And we, uh, and we bring in like Dennis has been there with me. And uh, uh, we bring like uh, IFAX, like it's really good IFAX because they're not getting the medical supplies they need. And not yeah. only we give them that, but we last time we went, we brought an 18 Delta special forces medic doctor to teach them how to use it. So yeah. now we're. So we're giving them that. We use it to be able to pour, and then we stay with them, and we then we do our spiritual resiliency program, helping them mentally and spiritually be prepared. Have you put that word out to the Deltas to get them in? He's an 18 Delta. I'm sure oh, the guys are looking. Oh, man, yeah, we'll take 18 Deltas. <laughs> all day long. All day long to yeah. go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, that's that's what we need the most uh, for our support is uh, to bring 18 Deltas to do that because uh, that's their biggest need because they even if they get medical supplies, so, yeah, they yeah, have no sure. idea how to use it, right? They don't know how to... Oh, yeah, de- that's de- not deflate a lung right, yeah. or do a sucking chest wound. Yeah. And so and, and we bring our audio Bible sticks for them and, and resources. We got a lot of stuff translating Ukraine. And, and I've been getting a lot of heat. Like, why are you going over there helping? There's, Zelensky's corrupt. And I don't care. Like, our, our politicians, Biden's corrupt. Like, that, none of that matters to me. This is like, these, pe- these people didn't ask for any of this. And they're being invaded by a super world superpower. I've, I mean, I, I leaked to Fox News, like, mass graves. I've seen them with my own eyes. And and uh, civilian apartment buildings that hit with yeah, so what kind of fighting missiles. are we talking about when, when is it like in this all the time in the city going block to block like we did in some towns or is it standoff sniper stuff or it, i mean it, is, it, is there army no it's it's very it's it's something like we never seen before it's kinetic uniform on uniform I know, I don't uh, know and so yeah so i mean yeah it's uh i mean this What's is that look like? it's like it's like world war ii right it's so, tv right like yeah like band yeah. of brothers type shit yeah so i mean i was in the zoom and uh me and seaspray were in a zoom which russia had occupied for six months and we were with the mil- the ukrainian military as they pushed through and and we went about two about an hour and a half past you were you were in kharkiv and i was there right mm-hmm. yeah so we went we went through and it was just two of us and the border collapsed the russians collapsed behind us and uh, and it was the craziest thing because I never had air over us. Two MIGs fly over, and we were like, "What are those MIGs?" And then they dropped it a gun run, and then uh, and then we had IDF hitting like hundred yards from us, like dirt hitting us. And and I'm like, I never encountered that before. And, and like I, I could show you my phone, like where we we were like moving with the Ukrainian uh, troops, and like we passed like sixty di- dead or dying Russian soldiers, uniform Russian soldiers, and and uh, Dude, that's huh. I mean, it was one of them like as they're like walking What's that over even like, man? What's that? What's that? I never experienced anything like that in Afghanistan. I mean, or anything. Like oh that. no! Yeah. I mean, well, no, we didn't, was, we didn't have most, that. It was the most kinetic thing I've ever seen. I mean, I wasn't participating in it. I was just right there with them, but like shoulder to shoulder with them. That's got to be. And crazy these guys were like, see what you're uh, shooting at to be able to tie like the the other team stand so up. How like, do, but how I, do they get? I see so much stuff on the news that they're actually targeting like orphanages or oh, yeah. hospitals or whatever. Yeah. So if it's none of that's making be... news, like none of that's making mainstream news, like that should be though. Yeah, but if it's uniform, it's supposed to be uniform to uniform. Why are they targeting the innocent? So like, so like the best example way to describe is like the Ukrainians will engage in a in a face to face fight with the Russians, and they'll bound away. And then next thing you know, they'll attack like a civilian uh, apartment building, and it's like a it's like a mental yeah, I like get it. deterrent to like oh, yeah, saying yes, yeah, yeah, yeah there's like yeah you, you're gonna fight with us, well we're gonna kill your women and children. Yeah. And I, I went to this one place and having a video, and you got these three co- apartment complexes, and each one of them are hit the exact same spot from the fifth floor to the ground. The whole building's gone. There's just women and children living in this these buildings, like thousands of people, like killed, and they're you know air striking it. And, well, what's the, you know, the end game on that? Because you, you got to either kill all of them, because if you don't kill every single one of them, they're gonna they're gonna hate each other. I mean, they'll hate they hate them for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, and Russia okay. wars last twenty years. Yeah, they'll keep they'll keep they'll put, just keep I mean, at this. I, I think I think it's it's going to continue to get worse. It kind of has to get worse. Uh, to, to, oh sure. I mean, so, you know Zelensky can't fight. back yeah, down, man. but Putin's not going to back down. And he then, can't. Yeah, he can't. He's Russian. <laughs> yeah, he, he can't. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's got to yeah. die. Yeah. And or, or win. Zelensky's. The Ukrainians believe they're winning, so Zawinski can't forfeit land. And uh, I mean, who, which one of your kids do you give up? 
like say that out loud. <laughs> yeah. Like if you if you yeah. if you're watching a fight go down, say them two factors. Yeah. So do you think it'll just go on for another? How, like our wars, like the ten, twenty. Yeah, I think so. I think, not, I think right? I think it'll keep going. I mean, I think there'll be there'll there'll be some kind of like line at some point that'll be established and they'll hold that line and they'll fight there. Like you know, the, 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 yeah, like. Yeah, just yeah. Do you yeah. think we'll ever get involved? We are. We are. I mean, we, like we're, we're we're by proxy. Like a, uh, I mean, at war, Russia right it's the now. The worst. But our <laughs> troops aren't in the Ukraine. Are no, they? no, yeah. they're not. And uh, but if we would not move them out of Ukraine, this would have never happened. Uh, you know, I think uh, because of Article Five, that, that Putin would have never went into Ukraine if we would have not moved them out. We moved them out, and we moved our embassy out. We moved our consulate out, and that made all NATO move out, which created a vacuum for and green light for Russia to just come in. When did that happen? Uh, in February, like right. Oh, that's yeah. when it happened. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So as as soon as we moved out. Russia moved in, yeah, and so, you know, and I think I think Afghanistan ties to this, right? Because uh, you show how we handled Afghanistan, and Putin's like empowered and emboldened, and then uh, and unfortunately, the next step is China, because China's watching this and they're watching us deplete our military surplus, and send, send billions of dollars, and uh, and now they're you know they're looking at Taiwan and they're waiting to uh, watching us weaken ourselves, and you know Taiwan Taiwan will be next because they believe just like Putin believes Ukraine belongs to Soviet Union, Taiwan believes. Uh, China believes Taiwan belongs to them, and mm-hmm. so this this is a this is a chain like in the secret series of events that puts us in a really bad spot. So tell us about the fall of Afghanistan. Yeah. Of- well, um, with the, my experience with disease was probably a little different than most interpreters. Uh, most interpreters like, experience because I, I, at my unit I was a, what's called an AFO, Advanced Force Operator. And so uh, I, did, I wasn't like a kinetic assaulter on my on my unit. I, I went out ahead of my unit to do all the clandestine infrastructure to build the the network that we use to put assaulters on targets. So usually, in, a, in when you're going in non permissive areas, there's a, a AFO team that goes in advance and builds the the way to clandestinely get on target. And so that's what I did. And usually, you work with like one other teammate. Uh, I was assigned. I had another SEAL that worked with me, and uh, or or you work in a singleton capacity. And so towards most of my time, I worked in a singleton capacity with Aziz. Uh, so I worked by myself with Aziz and uh, all of the, you know, Afghanistan across the border and Pakistan. Uh, and uh, we did all eight, but for continuity purposes, we did all eight of my deployments together. So Really? Uh, yeah. So so like most interpreters, right, you get a different interpreter every time. For my, wow. For, so I had I had Aziz for all eight of these deployments. So we became very, very close. And uh, yeah. and, uh, he, and he, he was at that command for 15 years as an interpreter of that command for 15 years. But I was, just, I was, for this operation, it was me and him. And so, like, uh, I say, he saved my life specifically on three times. Uh, he just got awarded by, recognized by Congress for saving uh, operation that he and I did, where he, 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 I mean, I was like assigned to be the team lead for this organization operation, but he really led the operation, and we went, at, we went in an all night operation to move four team guys out that was caught in a, in a, a QRF would have created more problems. Uh, and but he, uh, he led this. Operation. If people hear hear people talk like that and like ah seals, they wouldn't get in there. Like yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we get our asses in pickles all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, those guys. It's a thing. Those four, those four team guys would could have killed their way out of there, no problem. But to protect the the operation, they needed to be moved out and, and extracted in a clandestine way. And, uh, and and I was like trying to problem solve, and Aziz was just like, "Hey, let's accommodate the vehicle, let all that operation." And we got those guys out and their equipment out, and, and the, the operation was never compromised because of him. So. Uh, so Congress wow. just recognized him for that, but uh, which was cool because I think he was the first Afghan recognized by Congress. But wow. but but he he rec- he saved my life like multiple times, and uh, I could even share a couple of stories. But funny stories. But uh, but m- your brother said it best, like when he when he give he, your brother spoke at Aziz's welcome home party. He said, you know, guys like Aziz, they save our life every day. Like don't walk there, don't talk to that person, Can't don't eat it. that. Like, they, they just and he would always put himself before me. And when we went out in the mountains operating, I didn't go back to Bagram, and he went home i went to his house like hatra his wife would cook my first warm meal out of coming out of the mountains mm-hmm. and i was i held mashud and mashud eyes his oldest kids when they were babies i held them they're their family to me yeah. and so when the withdrawal was happening i was worried about a couple of things one i didn't believe we should the withdrawal should have been done happened the way it was right. and, and uh, but i couldn't do anything about that but i was also worried about my friend and i wasn't gonna leave him there and i made a decision to you know, put a team together to go get him it needs to be or is there uh-huh. if there is it's probably not streamlined when we when we get sent in to do something like this, the minute yeah. the turp straps up, there's a yeah. pipeline. Yeah, just like with anything else. And it's as soon as we we they get done with us, they come over. There's a spot. It's this, it's that, and the other. Some of those are the best Americans we'll ever have. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hardest fighting, best guys. I mean, just well, one of the things about disease, I've been saying this a lot. I've been speaking uh, uh, about this book is, I remember like 
you know, I wasn't a kid when I went to, Af I'd already been around for like, you know, nine years in special operations. So I had a lot of experience and but I don't think, I, I, I thought I was super mature then, but I probably didn't have a lot of life experience that I thought I had. But I, I remember like being on, having the conversations with him and he'd be talking about like freedom and democracy and fighting and willing to die for it in a way that I never heard an American talk yeah, about yeah. it before. And this is like, like talking about for his daughters to be able to be educated and not be forced to be married. He didn't have daughters yet by the time but he's talking about this. And, uh, and I'm like, this guy's never even seen freedom. He's never even seen democracy before, but he understands it's better than I even do. And he's yeah. willing to die for it. And like, so a lot of these guys, they, they have such a contrast and, and what Americans become naive or, or, or uh, just accustomed to and take for granted, frankly. Oh, that, well, we uh, do the same thing. We yeah. live through it now. It's getting taken for granted. It's on the yeah. opposite end of yeah. it. But the fire and the taste yeah. is what he had. And when you see somebody that has the original taste for it, you, under, you, know, you understand it. Yeah, I mean, he, he was... He was a you know a, a 1776 American like, That's it. like <laughs> just imagine yeah. we were sitting there in uniforms as a cohesive unit, but yeah. you know how far it went. Yeah, like we show up with with the stuff that we do, and then they're in the original 1776 version of it, wanting to fight for it. Yeah, and, and for us, it taught us a valuable lesson. As this is what it was like in the beginning. Is yep. he the same age as you? Yeah, he, he just turned forty. Yeah, so I'm forty seven. He just turned forty. Yeah. for Afghan, I'm, I'm I'm probably way younger than him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Man. <laughs> catches up in the end. Dude. <laughs> Did you know the average person has around twelve paid subscriptions? Just let that sink in. There's so many subscription based services these days that many just slip under the radar and rack up charges without you even noticing. And trust me, it starts to add up. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, it monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. When I first downloaded Rocket Money and saw those subscriptions that I was still paying for, I couldn't believe it. Between all the free trials I forgot to cancel, other streaming services I downloaded just for one TV series, and all of the ones that I typically use, I had over 20 subscriptions. It was ridiculous. Luckily, all I had to do was click the cancel button on the app, and it automatically canceled anything I didn't. For sure. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so we, you know, we, I mean, and by the way, like, a lot of people don't agree with me on the withdrawal, but I, I don't feel like, I believe American people were lied to, to say that we were in this 20-year war, this endless war. I mean, I, obviously, I didn't want my son my sons keep fighting the same war I fought in, like we were talking about earlier. But to say that we had to exit this war uh, and, and leave Afghanistan in the way we did, it was just not true. I mean, we were not in a 20 year war. When President Trump dropped that move in, uh, in 2018, the conventional war was over. We had shifted to support and advisor role of the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police. We could have just declared the war over at that time. And in, in the Bagram Air Force Base, the most strategic place in the globe between Iraq, Iran, Russia, and China. And we needed that location in the international community. We're all participating with us. At one point, we had 2,500 troops there. We were all participating to support the Afghan National Army to keep the Taliban at bay in the mountains of Afghanistan. It was actually working this international effort. And, you know, historically, we haven't, we've kept contingencies after wars. We have 80,000 troops still in Japan and 40,000 troops in Germany and 35,000 in South Korea. And for those that think oh, I'm a warmonger for saying that, like, like, I think that prevents wars. That right. keeps us from wars by having these contingencies. So they, to keep... A 2,500 uh, man contingent force in on Bagram Air Force Base and, and turn it over to the international community would have been the right strategy, not to do a full withdrawal. And then we moved out our, our military. We shut down Bagram Air Force Base. We moved out our military before we moved civilians out, before we moved our allies out, before we moved our $85 million equipment out. And we gave the NEO operation uh, from the from the DOD, the non-combatant evacuation operation from the DOD, we gave it to the State Department and they did not know how to handle that. That's not their job to do it. And so we, and one of the things they did, the big mistakes they did, the White House and the State Department is they gave a date to withdraw and not terms. Instead of saying like, we'll leave when we get every American out, when we get right. our equipment out, when we get our allies out, yeah. they, they give a date and the Taliban did not budge on that date. Sense. It's very much common sense. And I, that's why I don't think it was a mistake. I don't think it was a blunder or a debacle. Like people say, I think it was deliberately done that way for ulterior motives. Yeah. It's, it's always, hey, <laughs> Something like that. Look right here, because something else is going down over. I mean, China had so much to gain for us leaving the mineral rights in the Hindu Kush Mountains, which I said before that, and people call me a conspiracy theorist. But on, we left on August thirty first, and in the first week of September, China had the mineral rights to the Hindu Kush Mountains and trillions of dollars of. Oh, they call that back in the day. It used to be called Candyland. Yeah, 
trillions of dollars worth of lithium. The jewelry, there. the jewels yeah. in the ground, every, that, yeah. the yeah. minerals yeah. in that ground. Yeah. Before is, I didn't know when Alexander came around and did his whole thing, all this, the towns of Alexandria, Alexandria, yeah. uh, Kandahar we used to be called Alexandria. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Yeah. And then you go further back to it, the, the overall reference back in them days was it was Candyland because of all yeah. the, the riches. And then, then you have, Iran has sanctioned oil. Yeah. China needs oil. The only thing that was between China and that sanctioned oil was a U.S. military in, in Afghanistan. So now they're already moving that oil. Uh, and then Bagram Air Force Base, the strategic military location, which would have been st- incredible for us for Russia and China uh, and Iran and Pakistan ISI. All those places, we, we're not there anymore, nor are any of our allies there anymore. In fact, China and our, our enemies occupy it. So those, there was a lot of things that I didn't agree with, but the one thing I could actually do something about was to go get my friend. And, uh, and so that's what we chose to do. Well, good on you for doing that. Can you tell us a little bit about that day? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> there's a lot that goes into that, that story. Uh, there's a guy named Bashir who I, I mentioned earlier, he rolled on... Um, rolled over to the Taliban while he was working for us. And he was a, he was a government, U.S. government intelligence uh, uh, trained person that was on our team. He rolled, flipped over to the Taliban, compromised our operation. He's the one that had the V-bid dro- driven my house, uh, had me, had me uh, abducted by a neighboring country for an intelligence agency, uh, went, got, had some of our guys killed, and, uh, and then ultimately uh, was going after Aziz. Uh, after that happened, you got abducted. abducted? Yeah, so, in Afghanistan. Uh, in a neighboring country. So, oh my gosh! So I'll tell you guys when the microphone's off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, holy shit, that's yeah. crazy. Um. So this guy Bashir, um, and I write I write about him in the book. He he, he had a he had a really uh he really had it out for Aziz. We so our command went after him. Your 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 guys went after him and, yeah. ca- and caught him. And so we got him and he had like, he had like a journal with like, this is where Chad sleeps, this is where, you know, so-and-so sleeps, this is where so-and-so sleeps. This is their, they're deviating near times and routes and here's the times and routes they're using and here's where the safes are. So he was like for months like tracking us. And uh, so, so uh, he went to jail at Bagram jail. Then he went to Polacharki jail. Then he went to Saudi Arabia. He was released during a prisoner release in like 2011 when, when Obama let a bunch of people out. And so he goes back to the Taliban and as soon as like in April, he starts going to Kabul and looking for some of our old guys. And so Aziz goes on the run. So Aziz was like our ticking clock, like Bashir was like looking for him. And so we, uh, so we started trying to find ways to go get him out. And I put together, I, call, I started calling guys that had ASO or AFO level backgrounds that had that singleton ability to work without a lot of resources. And I was also looking for guys, and you appreciate this probably, I was looking for guys that already, already had their wild oats of combat zone. I didn't want yeah. a bunch of guys that are out there looking to go fight the Taliban because yeah. that's, not what we're going there to do. And, uh, you know, I knew we probably wouldn't even be armed. And uh, so I didn't want anybody that was going to go out there and, you know, try to get some. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so much mature guys. And so we put together this team and, and, uh, and we, we had guys, we had some team guys, we had uh, Green Berets, Force Recon guys, and a few guys from Ground Branch that had some really good precision rescue experts uh, and uh, paramilitary officers that are purpose prison rescue mm-hmm. experts. And so as we put plan together go, to go get Aziz's wife and six kids, they, this one of the guys that had uh, brought into our attention that was 3,500 orphans. And that was kind of a moment that we kind of paused and said, uh, hey, like, look at the experience we have. We all, like, pretty strong people of faith and felt God was burning our hearts to, to help. And so we just said, uh, you know, let's help as many people as we can, Americans, interpreters, uh, women, children, Christians, every persecuted. And so we made a decision to do that. And honestly, we've gotten a lot of credit since. And, and uh, in, in the Bible, it's 2 Corinthians 11.30 says, if you boast, boast in your weakness. Uh, I can boast in my weakness here because all we did was probably was obedient to that burden that we had in our heart. And then after that, we, I believe we saw a divine miracle. Like in the next three days, the, there was a series of events that happened that, uh, that allowed us to be able to not only rescue Aziz and his family, but 17,000 people. And if any one of those things didn't work perfectly, and none of us had any control over them working. If any of those things that worked perfectly, we would have never been able to do it. The first was that uh, Sarah Verardo mm-hmm. called, contacted the Joint Chiefs and used her influence to get the Joint Chiefs to allow us as civilians to fly foreign military aircraft on the DOD-controlled HKI airport to land it there, go outside the wire, which the military wasn't even allowed to go outside the wire, go outside the wire, get people, bring them back in, manifest them, and fly them to a third-party country. That's like impossible. And uh, I believe that was a miracle that we were allowed to do that. Secondly, now we're going to fly people out of that country. They don't, they're, they're SIVs, P1, P2 visa applicants, but they don't have visas, so we can't fly them to the States. 
we, we and, you know, a lot of people gave us a hard time. Like you guys are bringing people. We don't know who they are. I'm not the state department. I don't, have, I don't have the ability to bring people to the United States. I just have the, we just had the ability to evacuate people, but we needed a legal place to bring them because if you move someone without a visa to another country, that's human trafficking. And I've been joking saying the only place you could do that is Laredo, Texas. <laughs> and, uh, right. yeah. But, uh, but, but we, uh, but we, we called, we had a con connections with the Royal family and UAE and we called them and within an hour call, they gave us permission to use their humanitarian center, but we're all the red carpets with doctors and resources and everything. And in addition to that, they said, we'll give you a C-17 plane with pilots. And if you fill it, we'll give you another one. Then after that, Glenn Beck, radio show host, Glenn Beck called me and he said, Hey, I just went on the radio to raise. I thought I raised a few thousand dollars to help out, but I got in three days, I got $21 million. Like, what do I do with it? Oh, shit. How about Glenn? <laughs> yeah. We How about that freaking Glenn. guy, man? Yeah, he ultimately raised $46 million. And, and I just said, man, I need you to charter a plane. So he, he, Mercury One's his charity. Rudy Atala, this amazing dude named Rudy Atala, he, Glenn gave, assigned him to us and he just chartered planes for us. And it was, it was just Glenn incredible. Glenn is an amazing human being. Oh, incredible. He, I yeah. mean, I don't. We could talk. Well, he's all the first way one long. I met when I got back. Yeah, oh, really. He, yeah. he was like, he's awesome. He really took Marcus. He, he wrote the forward on this too. Oh, did he? Yeah. He's smart. That knows us something about everything, man. He is brilliant. Great family too. He gave a speech at our wedding. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Wedding. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, we freaking love Glenn. We haven't talked to him in a long time, but I have. I haven't. <laughs> yeah, but I check in. I make sure I check in with the family. Just uh, it's it's been. Uh, that is good. When man. Marcus good and I dude. met, I told you like we met and everything happened super yeah. quick. But he took me on this like tour of people to get approval from. Like uh -huh. I needed a <laughs> people chat. needed. I didn't realize that was what was happening, but that's what was going <laughs> you're on. Getting, you're getting interviewed. Yeah, I was getting interviewed. Good. good to go. Okay. Glenn was one of the, Glenn and his wife were one of those uh, checkpoints of. I kind of got passed, passed around when I got back. Did she pass yeah. the test? And I fell in love with that family. They're yeah, a great they're awesome. family. Yeah, yeah he talked to me like I was a kid, dude. Like, hey, look, I need you. Yeah. To you got to, what are you doing? Like, yeah, I'm like, hey, you know. But he has the biggest freaking heart. He does. Yeah, he really does. Yeah, he he gave us the he gave me the Bonhoeffer Angel Award for doing this, and and uh, honestly, like in Congress, reckon the only thing we did was said was said yes, and then like I said, I seen God do perform a miracle. And that first ten days, we didn't know how much time we would have. But our ground team, C Spray, Sean G, Tim Kennedy, they were going outside the wire at the airport. We had the team Timmy. in Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so it was just like How about that dude? Oh, yeah. Tim, Tim <laughs> man. A lot of people get, give him such a hard time, man. He was Why? Well, Who does? Uh, it's who, crazy. Who? Oh man, the Green Beret community. That's what I was talking about earlier with her. Like the Green Gosh. Beret community like went after him and but it's like this dude, like, he was offered like a lot of money to go. He volunteered to come here. He didn't have to do this. <laughs> he didn't have to do this at all. Yeah. He just um, and uh but, everyone likes to talk smack. Yeah, but he he uh so we we had 10 days. We didn't know how much time we had, but no one stopped, man. From the ground team, the Sarah in Washington, D.C., if you stop for like five minutes, you're like somebody's, you train that five minutes for somebody's life. You're like, Sea Spray lost 37 pounds in 10 days. And uh, and, and when that, when the air, when the, uh, the Abbey Gate was blown up and 13 of our service members died, the military welded those gates shut and uh, our military was forced to leave, but we didn't have to, so we chose to stay. And they, there was a lot of reasons we chose to stay, but one of them was the White House saying there was 100 Americans left and I, like without debate, there were thousands of Americans still there. Um, and the White House is saying, all they "Without gotta, question, all yeah. they got to do is go to go to the airport." One of our friends, yeah. one of uh, guy that Marcus was in you guys. team with, yeah, was, bunch of them actually. He was one of the very last to like get out, and he wasn't there like rescuing people. He was there working, had yeah. been there for months, and like no one knew that he was still there. His wife was. Flipping out. Well, the she White House was saying that they just have to get to the airport, and the, the but the, the State Department gave the Taliban the outer perimeter, mm -hmm. and so they controlled who got in and out of the airport, and they were murdering people in the streets. So, like, if you're like some 20 year old girl that went there to do missionary work or right, medical aid or right. teach, like, you're not going to show your blue passport to the Taliban, and so they were trapped there. And uh, and so, but the truth is, it didn't matter if there were a thousand or a hundred Americans there. Like, you don't leave one American there, and right. uh, and so we were like. I mean, you know, where we come from, we like scorched earth to go get somebody. Even like Bo Birdall, like the idiot mm -hmm. trader, like we we knew we were going to lose guys to go get him and people did anyway. Like, uh, I mean, you don't leave Americans behind. The White House even promised they wouldn't, but they did. And so we chose to stay. We, a lot of other amazing nonprofits work together. Mercury One, Task Force Argo, Pineapple, like we're all coordinating stuff. And and we got another 5,000 people out over two months from that uh, Mazda Sharif. And then when that airlift dried up, 
um, we knew we still had to do more because the Panjir Valley became a, a collective place for all these people that were trying to survive. And I got him, uh, if, you, if listeners know who Ahmad Masood is, he was the leader of Northern Alliance, which Bin Laden brilliantly killed him the day before 9-11 to break, break our alliance before it started. His son uh, stood up the resistance in Panjir Valley. So everyone's going there and the commandos are trying to evacuate women and children across the Tajikistan border. But we knew, and you know, knowing, and I know you're familiar with this area, like the mountains are 25,000 foot peaks. The the valleys are in the even in the summertime. This is like September, but the weather is still horrible in the, in the in the winter. And then Taliban's saturated this area. And then the Tajikistan border that is the Panjir River, which is Category Five rapids. It's ice melt water. If it stops moving, it freezes. Uh, so they had this obstacle with the river or cliffs and stuff like that. So worst environment imagine. Yeah, worst environment oh, imagine. That's all I gotta say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then then the Chinese military were there. The Russian military was there. The Tajikistan border guard was there. So we like they need information how to cross, and so that's our expertise, right? You do a, a route recon or, yeah. or fording reps, and so I uh, that's where Dennis came in, and I reached out to Lieutenant Colonel Tommy Waller, uh, who is his commander at Third Force Recon, and, and the military wasn't allowed to participate, but I just thought, and he's he has all the skill sets to to do this, to be my partner on this. He wanted to go, and so I called uh, him, and, I, and he said. I don't know, put in a, let's put in a writing that he comes on a humanitarian mission with you and, and they cut him loose and to let him come. So, uh, which is another miracle. And, and so we went, uh, we did, we flew into Tajikistan. We flew about, drove about 12 hours through his mountains and spent 10 days on that border. Did about 90 miles of border reconnaissance. And at night we swim in the, cross the river in Afghanistan and, uh, and build those fording routes out. We built six routes out and like literally between, like sometimes within 30 yards of the Taliban and uh, Chinese. How about that man military. doing, doing that kind of work is, the sexiest job. Those are the missions we all signed up for. That, that was you're saying. He's like, well, this is this is like stuff we signed up for. You're like, doing it for the church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, this is just. A, I mean, honestly, it was just route recons. And, yeah, yeah, and, I know, and, I know. And, but, and I mean, it's cool, though, but, it, right? but it's like a, but like, there's like, this is our bread and butter. Like, this yeah. is what, Shit, yeah, and, uh, and I had done it a long time. My wife's like, yeah, I've done this in a long time. What are you going out there and do this for? And I'm like, and she was, she started crying. It was really upset, and we were going to the airport and. She was okay with the, air, the evacs of H. Kaya, but she was not okay with this because she's like, "You're gonna swim in Afghanistan." I'm like, oh, "I won't." But uh, but uh, I'm, but I was like, "What what if this was us? You know, like what if it was my daughter that was to be sexually enslaved the rest of her life, or my sons that'd be forced to become Taliban, you know, terrorists? Like, wouldn't we be praying someone would come help us?" And and we had the ability to do it. I felt God was opening those doors, and so yeah. We, next we, time you see one of us walking around on the outside, just be like, you know, that's that's probably one of the ones that, that goes and gets them. You'll never see us do anything else other than that, man. Except when them freaking horrible jobs come up. Yeah. And that's what we're for. So did Mercury One, uh, Glenn Beck's nonprofit, did they fund all of that for you staying for so long? And No, um, Mighty Oaks Foundation uh, did a lot of the initial funding. Uh, We stood up Save Our Allies, which Sarah brought I'm not on the board there anymore, but I helped stand it up. And uh, Sarah brought are still there. and, and, uh, And so we pushed a lot of funding through them. Mercury One paid to charter all those flights. Uh, and we, we did some of them ourselves, but Mercury One chartered most of those yeah. flights. Millions of dollars. But you were just able to get all the funding just from straight up fundraising I just, I during was, that time. I was doing operations. I was planning operations. I was coordinating fundraising. It was so much wow, 24-7. Where do we go to buy a C-17? Can we buy those? <laughs> <laughs> Probably One of the old ones, man, do it up way right now. Oh, yeah, them? probably. Yeah. Hey, you want to go get our guns back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know where they're at. <laughs> I, yeah, I know where they're at, yeah. And they're for sale, too. By so. the way, these are our toys. <laughs> yeah, we'll get you taken Parents back. left them here. We're coming to get them back. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's, yeah. Oh yeah. My That's what I have to tell myself so I don't lose my mind. Have you, yeah. you know. stopped and pinched yourself yet? Like, that you actually lived this, you know, this is actual reality for you. It sounds like a crazy-ass yeah movie like an expendables kind of thing but at the time it seemed like it, when you're real time with something like that it doesn't seem crazy right. at all right it seems like it makes sense you, yeah you know when you just look back at it how about that but uh honestly i had a, I had a moment like flying there because i've dealt with a lot of anxiety panic attacks high, like high blood pressure like going to er with like and so I, I had been fine for a long time but i was thinking like man like what if i get out there as mountains and like dennis got four kids at home is what if i end up in this situation so i really and uh, for the last 12 years, I've been, you know, speaking to these recruits at MCRD and thousands of troops and talking to them about spiritual resiliency. And, I'm, and I said, when I went to Afghanistan the first time, those four pillars, I, had, I was mentally strong, physically strong, socially, I was the right team, but I didn't have the spiritual pillar and how I almost lost everything. And if you had all four of them, right, you would, you would have what it takes. And, and, uh, and I was like, man, I've been teaching that in theory. I never tested it. And uh, so I'm on that plane and just starting to be worried about that anxiety. And I just prayed 
that God, God, you burned my heart to be here. I need you to take away anything that physically or physiologically that's going to keep me from doing this and helping these people. And felt like a tremendous peace. I told Dennis about it on our layover. I said, hey, man, I'm dealing with this. He said, yeah, me too. And uh, we prayed together and then we got on a plane and we flew in to but there. You know, you know what that is, right? We didn't have that in the beginning. Yeah. I, I missed that too. <laughs> yeah. It's like, because you have all three of those, but there's the one missing mm-hmm. and it's the one that makes you feel okay. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's the biggest one. It's the biggest one. Because <laughs> there's no it. fear. Yeah. I mean, you know how much fun we have? Even if it's a straight up fight. Yeah. I mean, like brawl to brawl. If you yeah. know that's your ass is supposed to, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Because you don't tell us that part. Right. If you know that's. But when the boss rings down, he's like, not only are you supposed to do that, you need to do it with everything you got. Yeah. Don't it's the right thing back. to do. Don't yeah. even, you're the one that was designed for that. Yeah. And you can immediately tell when someone's in there who wasn't, who's not listening. Yeah. Because their ass gets, I mean, it's funny. You can just see like, it plain as day. It was like, I created you for this and I orchestrated this. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that was one of my biggest things that gave me peace is like, even if there was bravado inside of me that I don't see to go do this, which of course, I'm sure a lot of people think that's what this is about. But even if there was, there was no way for me to orchestrate that to happen. Oh, no. To get to, to get on that border to Tajikistan, that border was closed. We, we got we got, we got got the G-Bow permits oh, yeah. like to get on that border. That border was closed. For them to have two Americans go in there and look like us, to go on that border, like, I mean, it, God orchestrated us to be there. Yeah. And so just don't, knowing that was gave me the, like a piece, like we're supposed to be doing this. Mm-hmm. Well, we're supposed was, to be. There's a difference we were talking earlier, man. There's a, there's an age gap between if you believe in a coincidence and then when you see past all that. Yeah. And when like when, once something happens to you, that's a normal day. Yeah. If one of those, what the, how'd that happen? If there's two of those, you're not behind the wheel. Go. <laughs> yeah. that, and it's easy. It's an open gate, right? Yeah, yeah. It's really cool when, when you're seeing that, and yeah. it's even better when there's somebody next to you. Yeah. And you're like, bro, did you just catch that? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. he'll that move was cool mountains the same page, for right? anybody yeah. doing his work, so. Yeah. And, uh, and it, we were, one of the things we prayed for is that we wouldn't get tired because we knew we weren't going to sleep for 10 days. Oh, yeah. And uh, like we were not sleeping like, you know, Two hours a day. Oh, yeah, uh, and, and they just, you just never got tired. Yeah, that's cool, right? We, we had one team guy that, tried to, uh, that was a uh, he was eighteen Delta two, and he's like, he's he was doing a, our like kind of uh, what lo- local like a, like local survey. He was like giving us the the lay of the land. He's yeah. like, you cannot cross that river. He's like, oh, you're gonna. Yeah, yeah. I was messing with him in the book. He's actually a really cool guy, but I was bust, busting him in the book because he's like a. Uh, He's like, you get in that river, like it's so cold, your body's gonna cramp up. And I'm like, well, the water freezes the same in Colorado as it does. The, the water didn't freeze any colder in, in Afghanistan. And uh, I, I've been in that cold water before. And and uh, but he was but he was busting our chops and we didn't built to cross that river. Mm-hmm. And it was cold. I give it that. <laughs> it took it take the breath of your lungs. Team guys hate cold water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we won't go anywhere near. Like, hey, bro, go ahead. I'd have been fired. I'm like, sure you can. You can go Matter of <laughs> fact, I I'm not the one. You you can do it. <laughs> they hate cold water, but every Ooh. year on Christmas Eve Eve, him and Hunter jump in the coldest water. <laughs> yeah. Every Christmas Eve Eve, and this year, Christmas Eve Eve was the coldest day in, like, history for better, Texas. Huh? Of, in, of the earth. History yeah. of the earth. And they literally, <laughs> they ran we were barefoot there. <laughs> and jumped in a pond. We're supposed to do that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they do it every, every year. year. Oh, but cool. he hates cold water, and he still subjects himself to it. I almost had a heart attack. It almost killed me. I going to run back up. I was like... I, I, I used to feel super tough doing doing the cold water stuff, but now they got like now they got like a uh, you know fifteen year old girls doing. Oh, the, I saw that. The, the, the plunges. It's the, a thing. I'm like, ah man, like it took they took the toughness away from. I was like, yeah, yeah. There's a thing. It's, there's a, it, it works. Yeah. I mean, it's real. It really does work. It's a thing, man. But woo. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, your story is just yeah. incredible. So when you were able to actually get him out, were you able to get him to the U.S.? Yes. So I, I, I. So actually, I, I want to make sure I give credit, like. The guy who actually got him out was, uh, we were coordinating, trying to move. We tried eight times because that, that airport was crazy. Like, mm-hmm. thou- you've seen it on the news, thousands of people and people getting trampled to death and people surfing their babies over and trying to throw their babies yeah, over the wall in the Constantino awesome. wire. Like, Joe Joe Robert kind of five dead babies in the Constantino wire because as they're throwing these babies over, they didn't oh know God. there was Constantino wire on the other side. Uh-huh. And, uh, and so, like, the level of desperation, like, he, he was getting shot at. He's got Mosh, Mosh Kaur, his youngest is uh, six years old at the time. He's seven now. And, and to 18 years old, six kids. His wife had just had appendix surgery and it was bleeding. So it was like, and we finally got him uh, in to, to the gate and Sean G was on one side. I was, I was talking to them both and Aziz was on the other side so we couldn't get to him. And uh, we called the guy, a power rescue guy who was in the in the wire uh, and uh, his team agreed to go out and uh, let him in. And uh, so they, they saved him and got him inside. And I got to meet him in Abu Dhabi and we had our embrace there. And then we got him after nine months in the humanitarian center, we got him here and he lives right here. 
Oh. In Magnolia. He does live in oh, Magnolia? Yes, Magnolia. Yeah. We have yeah. to take him to dinner. Oh, he loved that. He loved that. Oh, my god. Yeah. Gosh. In fact, he was he was supposed to come here to meet you. Because I, I was telling him about, I, like I said, I hadn't told many people about the other thing earlier, but he was part of that. And I was like, I wanted him to meet you because of that. Oh, the one who rescued me lives up the road. Yeah. 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 yeah Gulab is in Fort That's Worth. Awesome. So um, that is crazy. We should have dinner with your wife. And oh, yeah. It'd be great. It'd be great. How many's with him? He's his wife and six kids. They're all here. They're all here. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're the huge families over there. Yeah. The women yeah. are UFC champions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they can have lots of babies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, lots of babies. Yeah. I... Hotcher, Hotcher is like, she's awesome. She's got such a funny personality yeah, and great. she's awesome. They go to our church with us at Woods Edge now. And, so uh, you want to know how yeah. wonderful Afghani and those women are? You know that because their men keep them away from us. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know anything about those cultures or anything like that, man. They are. They're 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 wonderful people, man. Yeah. I tell That's why they hide them. Like, it's like, I, it's been sad. I've been on a few interviews that people are like, just because people served with you know, with us doesn't give them the right to be you know our neighbors, and, and it's, it's been real disappointing. Well, what? Who said? Like reporters are saying. <laughs> yeah, say that I mean, one more time. That, that there's been people that I've been interviewed with. I was just on Mike Berry's show last week, and he was really anti-immigration of Afghans, and I was pretty disappointed to to hear that. You know, he's like, just because somebody served and fought alongside of us doesn't give them a right to be my neighbors, and <gasps> I'm like, man, you know, like who said that? Mike Berry, the radio show host. Oh, I know In him. Houston? Yeah. In Houston, yeah, I was really surprised, and it Ooh, broke yeah. my heart actually, to be honest with you. And uh, and oh uh, and and uh, and yeah, but he said it. I mean, I'm not. And his wife. I'm not talking trash on it because yeah. it's on the air, right? It's uh, he's he's on the air and said it and argued with me. And I was like, I was like, even if we disagree on that, the United States government contractually made an obligation to these people, and uh, and and it's our national interest to to uphold that. How will we ever get support again? And uh, yeah, there's been a lot of people. Uh, Charlie Kirk, surprisingly, uh, he was he kind of pushed back against me with it. And, uh, I've been I've been pretty broken hearted about it. But pe if people really knew who the Afghan people were, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Afghans are entrepreneurial. They're hard workers. Uh, they're not the Taliban. Yeah. <laughs> they're no. not the Taliban. It's like Crips and Bloods. Yeah. yeah. I, I, the best way I, I had a chief break it down for me earlier because I was nerd. You know, I didn't know. You're looking at those maps. There's the grid and the city. It's like, all right, man, just imagine you're the world police. Right. And we just threw you in the town. These are the bangers you're going to get. Yeah. I mean, it's a different kind of gang, but same principle. Only you're highly trained. Yeah. Highly, highly trained. And then you get your guys that come in. Imagine the guy on, on because we have Iraqis, Afghanis that are American. They're, they're sitting there with us. Only problem is we didn't give him a uniform. Right. So they knew who he was. Mm -hmm. our, our Turks. Yeah. I mean, it's, they're the, they got the most, most dangerous job there is. Oh, yeah. And were we going when we're not on deployment? They're still there. They left behind and their families are at risk. They're, and, they're in pass down. Yeah. One of, one of the if, things that. If they're real good, we'll pass them down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. One it's of the things that, that made me so mad during the evacuation was President Biden got on the news and said, if we if these people won't fight for themselves, then why should we fight for them? 60,000 of them died fighting for their country. That's like the equivalent racial-wise based on the population, like our civil war. Like 60,000 people, hundreds of thousands of Afghanistan fought. They were fighting for freedom and, and we were and we, and we gave them that for 20 years. Yeah. And, uh, and we now took it look away. what's happening with all the stuff with the women and... yeah. It's they can't. Awful. They took medical care away last week. They uh, they said that they can't go see male doctors, but they can't be educated to be doctors, and they can't be doctors. So there's no women's health care. I mean, they're already selling nine, nine, ten year old girls again. Uh, oh. So it's and no one's speaking up for it. And, uh, well, it's terrible. There's a people don't understand when when something powerful is standing against something that can't defend itself. Right. I mean, at all. You can't even talk back. You know, the weakest thing on the planet and the strongest thing. If they're in a room together, they they freaking know it. Right. And there there's there's a not only a separation with money and power, there's that physical power. Yeah. A lot of people we have in power don't actually possess it. We let them hold it. Mm -hmm. And then you got people who actually have power. Yeah. You know, when you walk into a room, nothing bothers you. No human, no nothing like that's going to mess with you. That is a power. Yeah. It's like being good looking or smart or something. It's the ultimate one, actually. Yeah. And hopefully, you, you know, when, if you can negotiate, then, it's, then that's a power too. But if you're not very good at it, there's always this. It <laughs> ends everything. Do you yeah. think we'll end up doing just a civil war and just... Like, in Afghanistan, well, I think it, I think it'll be continuous. To, yeah, it's going to go continuous. back to this thing, man. Yeah, it's going to go back to this. They're, they're going to even the Taliban is going to fragment because uh, they're not going to like the way this guy's leading. Yeah, so they're yeah. going to start fighting each other. Oh uh, yeah, it'll just be. A, and then in like a hundred years, they get tired and then they go pick a fight with a big one, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just to yeah. show who. That's how they do it. Yes, yeah, they do it. Yeah, <laughs> think who, about who, it just like that. Who's really pulling the strings and all that is Pakistan ISI. They built the new Taliban, and they're they're oh. they're. Yeah, they're, they're the Pakistan's intelligence agency. There. And they've been Hatfield and McCoy's that whole yeah. area for yeah, forever. <laughs> ever since. Damn, back when the when it rained. They can't live they can't live without it. <laughs> no, yeah. I can't, bro. Yeah. Wasn't a lot of 
the guys that were fighting on the Taliban side for Red Wing were Pakistan, right? I thought I heard that at some point. On the, on the Taliban side? On yeah. the, like in the Taliban, oh, yeah, yeah, there was yeah, a lot of the yeah, Pakistanis yeah, 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 in there. So uh, well, I, write a, I don't know if I write about in the book or not, but uh, I'll tell you a story. You'll, you'll probably laugh at this story. So me and Aziz were in, you, you know what Peshawar is? Yeah. So, oh, so, oh, yeah. yeah. I figured you did. So Peshawar at the time, we, this was like 2006, like probably one of the worst cities in the planet. To be in. So Peshawar is like right on the other side of the Torkham border of, of Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's in the Pakistan side. And me and Aziz were doing our, our job there and, and we were just two of us and roll up to this little uh, place to get food. And it's like this Dairy Queen, concrete benches. And, and there's some Pakistan military there. And we got some rice and some quail. That's why I always went there, the best quail. So we're eating. You know, while we're eating, this, uh, this trucks pull up, Hiluxes, black flags, they're Taliban, like vest on, AK-47s, PKM on the top. And they're like, just got back from, they're coming from Tarkham. They're just got back from fighting U.S. troops probably. Yeah. And they're like, you know, get their mascara on their eyes and stuff. And I'm like, and so we're like, we're like checking them out. So we're still eating. And they sit down with the, with the Pakistan military, like hanging out. And, and one of them, uh, one of them sits on the other one's lap. He's got his AK. He sits on the other one's lap and puts his arm around them and, and they interlace fingers. And, uh, yeah. and he's got his legs crossed like a woman. And he's got a Pepsi bottle. Uh, with a straw in it, drinking it like the gayest thing oh my <laughs> I've ever seen. And, I, and I'm like, I'm like Aziz, I gotta get a picture. And Aziz is like, Don't do it, brother. Oh <laughs> Don't take the picture. I'm like, I got you, man. He's like, If you take that picture, they're gonna kill us. Oh <laughs> I didn't take, I didn't take the picture, but I wanted to tell it to so bad. <laughs> that would have been the best picture. That could oh, have been the cover. Of I book. wanted it so bad. <laughs> you need a sketch artist. Yeah, the hands <laughs> interlaced. He's got AK in his hand, a, a Pepsi bottle with a straw. Oh, like, oh. <laughs> they do have a lot of like homosexual like things that they do over there. Oh, yeah. I feel like a yeah. lot of it is very yeah. the Taliban's a bunch of desh homos. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it is like I know I know they're, they're li- I know they're listening and they are. <laughs> they, they know it too. They know it too. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Well, a bunch of child molesting. Uh, yeah, rape little they rape little boys yeah, the and, little and they, they start the generation night. generation of it over and over and over again. Yeah, but. There's so many, and a lot of the American public does not know about that. They don't know about the little, you know, man boy parties or whatever that they have that all of y'all have seen. Yeah. And it's normal for over there. But if if that was happening over here, yeah, all hell would break loose. It is, it is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, yeah, library time and yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> time and it's freaking probably worse. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have. An incredible story. That is just, it's awesome. I hope that this book does really well. Is there anything else? Yeah. You what's wanna... next? I mean, what do we need to do? Yeah. How do people follow that? I mean, you, you can buy movie see, time. We're... Yeah, it's already picked up. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's already oh, picked okay. Up. Good. Yeah, That's what is, I was. Yeah. Good. We don't have to talk about that online, but I mean, yeah. when yeah. that comes down, always ask because we yeah. got plenty of dudes out there now. Yeah. Matter of fact, most of our guys have integrated into their world yeah. so that we've set set the chalks. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Always yes. ask. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, Saving Aziz could be, we have savingaziz.org, or you can get anywhere. Amazon's probably the easiest place, and I think it's the lowest price right now. And you get it, get ready for a review. I know that helps. Uh, but uh, yeah, Saving Aziz is the book, and then a movie's going to be, uh, I'm not supposed to say much about it right now. But uh, Oh, then we won't the put mo- you on it. Hey, they're funny about that. Man. But the, mo- mo- the movie is coming, and I, c- I can say it's coming. Yeah. And, uh, and it's going to be done, it's going to be done right. Uh, awesome. I had a lot of offers, and, uh, and, uh, and we picked someone that's going to do it. I think it's going to do it right. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, because, because it's, so important to tell it right. It's better honor everybody. It's just like with anything else in that world. Yeah. I was yeah. blessed. Yeah. But they walked me through with just. Yeah, the Navy said, actually. I mean, side by side. Okay. I was covered down on big time. Okay, good. And uh, so much to the point that when they're like, hey, man, when the boy's coming up afterwards, make sure you pass this down. Yeah. So that's what I do, man. If you, if you guys need some help on something like that, at least direct you. If you got a name, you know how we do it. Yeah. It may be seven degrees from Kevin Bacon with us, it's one. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Like, if you don't know that dude, he definitely got somebody that can find it. Yeah. yeah. Period. Well, so, yeah, we got to fly and I'll tell you more about it. What, uh, yeah. um, about Sarah? Because uh-huh. she sounds like a freaking badass. She is, She, yeah. and I've messaged with her quite a bit. I feel like I'm already friends with her, but I yeah. haven't met her yet. Um, so she's running Save Our Allies. Is that something that you're going to keep? up and running for any future conflicts or whatever yeah i'm they are working in ukraine right now uh, i'm not sure like what they're going to do moving forward but you know sarah i think mainly nick pomachano mm-hmm. is, is running it um and then yeah, tim's still on the board sarah's on the board so i'm not sure what they're going to do moving forward uh but uh but they're still up and running right now 
so um, people can go on to saveourallies.org yeah, pe- and donate. Yeah. Yeah, people go. You know how we'll do it. We'll make it. We'll take it underground. Make it a secret society. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll just go yeah. in when the crap hits the yeah. fan. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then, they've already made movies about it. We just got to put it together. <laughs> yeah, put them together. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, Mighty Oaks. We have our international effort. So, yeah. and uh, and so that those, you know, both. In fact, at the, at the premiere of the book, we promoted both Save 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 Our Allies and Mighty Oaks Foundation. We promoted both organizations. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank absolutely. You for yeah, absolutely. That's good stuff, brother. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Owen. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, brother. Yeah.